Many people decide to try out martial arts at some point of their lives. And if they get into a good martial arts school, that's great. But on some occasions, it's also possible to get to some of the worst martial arts schools led by some of the worst martial arts masters out there. These so-called masters can range from unintentionally hilarious and simply not having a clue of what they are doing to sometimes even predatory and dangerous. In order to shed light on what crazy things these martial arts masters are doing and how to recognize them in order to avoid becoming part of such a school, I invited Rob of McDojo to share and compare together our individual lists of top five worst martial arts masters of all time. My number five, George Dillman, and he could be way higher, but I wanted to put him at the fifth place because he's so mainstream. And I think we'll still discuss that, but I think personally, it seems to me like he didn't damage, didn't create as much damage as some other fake martial arts masters, which I will still delve, delve into more in other ranks, but I don't know. So is, is George on your Ooh. list? He definitely made my list. And I thought it was a great idea that you said when we started to not tell each other our lists. And right. I think that yeah. that was awesome. And I, I had a problem. I was like, should Dillman be number five or he should be number one? It's like, I would put him at the back of the line for the reason that most everyone knows who he is. Right. You know, I would yeah. put him at the front of the line for the same reason is that he was right. able to become such a big fraud that out of all this list, if no one knows any of these other names, which you'll definitely learn about them today, if no one knows anyone else, they know George Dillman. Right. And, you know, you were talking about he hasn't done as much damage. And right. I maybe disagree in a way. And I think the reason is, is because he runs something called Dillman Karate International. And right. if you go on his website, I think it's either Dillman.com or GeorgeDillman.com. I'm sure we'll have it ready to go whenever we release I this. I think but... actually both websites exist. I just oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're both exist. What a narcissist. Um, right. You know, like if I had to choose between two different websites, I think I will make both of them have my yeah, name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but on, on those particular websites, there's just pages and pages and pages of instructors that are underneath him who mm. teach more that his particular style of Kyoshu Jitsu or Kyoshu Jitsu, however you want to pronounce it, I don't care. Um, Cause no matter how you translate it, it's nonsense. Um, but with his particular case, because it is so big, that he affected way more people into these weird belief structures. And mm. one of the one of the more famous cases that is one of my favorites that he's done, by the way, is I put it out there. He believes that he can tell the sex of a woman's child who was still pregnant just by holding onto their wrist and feeling the energy. You know, it's like there's no proof of that. You're just crazy old man. But then right, but you, you know, know he was the good part is there's like a 50-50 chance that she's going to make it. Yeah, <laughs> he's wrong with guys. <laughs> good, good, good odds. And take that guy to a roulette table and see what happens, man. Right. But, yeah. you know, when he goes, he goes on National Geographic and he has an assistant there, an assistant, like an instructor under him named Leon J. Now, Leon J is the son of someone who was pretty famous in his own right called Wally J. And Wally J did small circle jujitsu, which is mostly made up of small joint manipulations. Mm. It's kind of like, I guess you could say, a similar style to like Aikido minus a lot of the falling and the rolling and things like that that come with that. Right. Um, whatever you want to call the technical terms. Uh, mm. I'm not an Aikido guy, so I'm sure you know. Mm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. when it comes down to, to Leon J, the apple not only fall far from the tree, it fell off the tree, rolled down the hill, hit the highway, landed on a truck, and ended up three states away. That's how crazy this person is. And on this National Geographic episode, he winds up trying to knock out a producer of the show doing a no-touch knockout, and it just doesn't work. And the reason I mentioned him was because they asked George Dillman why it didn't work. And, you know, he went on a tangent about like, well, you see, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but uh, if you raise your big toe and put the other toe down and then you alternate them, can't knock you out with a no-touch knockout. Oh, and if the tongue is in the wrong place of your mouth, can't knock you out like that either. And, and he goes on like this tangent of all the reasons that it wouldn't work because of like something you did to defend it. But the truth is, is doing absolutely nothing will also cause it not to work because it's made right. up. <laughs> right. I guess, I guess because it, when I was looking at it and thinking about it, it's probably, I don't remember the right term, but like suggested hypnosis or something along those lines where people have to believe that. And they even like can actually come to a conclusion that, oh, it worked. But initially they wanted to be thrown around. They wanted to be knocked out. See, all they needed was just some someone to wave their hands. But if somebody who doesn't want to get 
it doesn't want to, for that to happen, obviously it's not going to work. And I also consider that joke sometimes that if it all that takes is to raise your toe or your tongue, it's like, oh, it's very easy. If, if like a no touch master attacks me, I'm like, I just raise the toe and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm free. So like, what's the use in that? But ob- obviously it's nonsense. But my question is because you know so much more about these guys than I do. Uh, so after that National Geographic uh, gig, the video, did he actually continue to just dive, uh, dive even deeper into his delusions? Or did that actually kind of shake him somehow and he became more careful? Do you have any knowledge about that? Yeah, for sure. Well, after that, he never did another interview and he refuses uh, to do it, to do interviews anymore. Um, <laughs> I why. What a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Why would he right. not do them? I mean, he looked so sane on that one. <laughs> right. But, you know, I call it Steven Seagal syndrome. You know, and so like, you know, Steven Seagal started off as a martial arts instructor and that was his job. And then eventually he got picked up by, I don't remember if it was a producer or a director Mm -hmm. that he was working with. That's how the story goes anyway. And they were like, you'd be great in a movie. Why don't you come teach, do this movie for us? And as for like Steven Seagal's first couple of movies, no matter what you think about Seagal himself, were awesome. Like, you know, they were good movies. Like, Under Siege was great. You know, like, uh, what is it? Hard to Kill and all those movies and stuff like that. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like those were great. It was because like it was unique and it was something different that people hadn't seen before. You know, Steven Seagal's snapping arms and breaking necks, and you know, even even one of the one of the scenes is one of my favorite actual fight scenes of all time, which is Uh him in the pool hall and he winds up like fighting Dan and Asanta. Right. Um, Yeah. 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 yeah, And he like puts the the pool ball and the 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 t shirt or something. He's just jacking people up with that. I was like, that is absolutely incredible fight scene. And of course. Several years and sandwiches later, those fight scenes are not as good anymore. But when it comes to Seagal, I think that the big thing was, is I don't think he had a lot of people telling him no. I think that once he reached a certain stardom, all the people around him just became yes men and anybody who probably, and again, this is an assumption, but a lot of people around him probably just didn't want to tell him no for the sake of he's a star and you want to be around him and you want something from him. And if you go against the grain, maybe he excommunicates you. So right. you just allow this crazy to start building. Next thing you know, Seagal's getting accused of molesting several women. Seagal's yeah. um, not only accused, but proven to have assaulted multiple people on sets. Um, mm. You know, even there's a story of how much people hated Seagal. Um, you know, he tried to do Saturday Night Live and everyone on that sh- that set absolutely hated him. Mm. Um, you know, to the point where like Saturday Night Live kind of like hides that particular episode because of how bad it was. Um, Or he was on the set of one movie that he did with DMX to where they were on a a scene with a boat and he was like yelling at everybody. And Tom Arnold was like there and witnessed this. And he tells a story about how he tries to storm off set, but he goes to open a door that's not a door to a real room. It goes right off the boat and he opened the door and everyone hated him so much that no one told him that this is going to happen. And he just dropped right off the side (laughs) of the boat into the water. You know, and so when you have this reputation of being an asshole, I think that what happens is is that people either accept it or they fight against it. And Mm -hmm. so it creates this delusion in your mind that you are this person. Steven Seagal, even on an interview one time, called himself a god. Like he calls himself this on an interview, refers to himself as a god. Is that like um, where he's like talking about some Buddhist stuff? And what's yes, that? yes. He's right, sitting at yeah. a table and he's like eating food and he's like out right. of breath while he's talking. But yeah. the reason I bring that up is because I think I see a lot of that in Dillman. I think if you look mm-hmm. at Dillman's career when he first started, he was a competitor. That was very much true. He right. did actually spar and compete against people in tournaments. He made Black Belt Magazine back in the day um, mm-hmm. and then move forward years from that and all of a sudden he believes he can knock people out with his mind somewhere along the road people had to accept that they had to be around him and just go you know what we'll just go with it you know and the next thing you know i think that it went from maybe a lie he was telling himself or a slight thought that he had and it turned into this massive delusion that he really does believe like he honestly if you listen to the man speak he really does believe he can knock people out with his mind that's insane but that wasn't a small road that took a long time for him to get that deep in the delusion to going from, yeah, I guess I kind of believe this, this is possible to, this is absolutely possible. It's like, no, it's not homie. You're just a crazy person. And so you're surrounded by other people who are enablers. Yeah. Yeah. What you're saying also brings up another point that I was thinking about Dillman. And one of the reasons why I wanted to put him on the list, not only because he's such a huge, well-known 
fake martial arts master, but also how he went on to hang out with these famous fighters and superstars like Muhammad Ali and Bruce Lee. I think there's the, you know, the list goes on. And I think, and I think a lot of people fell into believing that he actually is legit because, well, he's training with Ali. Obviously he's legit, but you know, it's like, no, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything he does is, it works. So I don't know. Do, do you know this you is what Dale Brown has done. And we're talking about martial arts frauds, right? And Dale Brown, he didn't make my list, by the way. Okay. But uh, because I was talking about the top. Like, right. but, you know, Mah- he has a picture with Bruce Lee. By the way, this is the only picture we've been able to find. So there is <laughs> a picture with him of Bruce Lee. And he's not even like next to Bruce Lee. He's okay. the guy next to the guy with Bruce Lee. And he's okay. not even like close to them. There's like a person gap. So if you go back and look at that photo, which should be easy to find, he's not like even close. It's almost like he almost photobombed that thing, you know? Right. But anyway, you know, and he was around Muhammad Ali. So when he was around Muhammad Ali, people like see photos of him standing by Muhammad Ali and being in the area of Muhammad Ali. Yeah. And he yeah. did eventually, by the way, wind up buying Muhammad Ali's gym. But if you know Muhammad Ali, or you've at least seen a lot of Muhammad Ali's footage, you'll know that he really liked people around him that were all about a joke. And so he was constantly like picking on people and ribbing on people. And to me, I think that George Dillman was probably just his jester. I think that it was probably easy for him to have him around just so he can poke fun of him because Muhammad Ali is a real person. He's a realist. And he never thought that he could knock people out with his mind, you know? And so like, why didn't Muhammad Ali ever do the no touch stuff on people? Like he was training with Dillman. No, I think that Dillman used these photos as a way to fool some people into believing that he was closer with these people than he really was. He even tells a story, by the way, about being woken up at like 3 a.m. because Bruce Lee called him from overseas and they had this conversation. Like, do you really honestly think that if him and Bruce Lee had such a close relationship that we would have like multiple photos and videos of them training together? We don't. We have a picture that he's like offset from, <laughs> you know, right. it's crazy. It's a crazy person. Yeah, I and there's one last thing, which is also in my mind. And you mentioned that already, like Dylan, from what I gather, start off with boxing. So, you know, legit, as legit as it gets, especially in striking. And then he apparently organized these tournaments where I don't know exactly like whether how full contact that was, but still it's, it's sports, it's competition. But then it's, it's an interesting case scenario, like case study that he actually knew how functional martial arts work at least to some degree but he still managed to become so delusional where i think you know those are two things are not necessarily mutually uh exclusive it's like i i love bringing up the video of anderson silva teaching knife defense you probably know which one i'm talking about yeah because i posted it before (laughs) right yeah yeah probably i might have seen it from you so so it's like yeah if the person is good at fighting for for example it doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to become delusional. And I think George Dillman is a pretty extreme, but good case of that. For sure. And I think another thing is, is that we kind of make, I guess you could say, people who are martial arts instructors bigger than life, that they can do no wrong, which is a major issue. We're automatically giving these people a position of power when we start martial arts. We're saying, you know what? First of all, I have to admit, I don't know how to, tr- I don't know how to fight. That's the first step in martial arts, your journey, right? I don't know how to do this skill. So I have to go to somebody who's good at this skill. And that skill, unlike other things, like if you were going to go learn how to paint, the last thing in your mind probably is this guy could kick my ass, you know, but he can outpaint me. But when you go to martial arts studio, that guy probably can beat you up. And so that's automatically giving this person a little more power over you. And then the next step is you can't be rude to them. You have to actually take a step back and listen to what they have to say when they're teaching you a class. So Mm -hmm. speaking out in the middle of class is extremely rude, no matter what you're learning. And so a lot of people hold their tongue and they don't speak out. And then next thing you know, this person has got way more power than you really should give them. Like all of a sudden you're calling this person your mentor. You're calling this person like your dietitian. They're helping you with diet advice when they're not actually licensed dietitian. They're your strength and conditioning coach when they aren't certified as a strength and conditioning coach. And you're making them all these things like your psychologist, you're going to them for advice. When in all honesty, they're just people. They're just people. They just happen to have a skill. And it's a service, by the way, you pay for. You're saying, hey, I would like to learn this. Here's money in exchange for this service. That really should be the end of it. Anything else that we add to that is what we do on our own. 
We're choosing to make this person our mentor. We're choosing to make this person our psychologist, our friend, our uh, our guru. You, they don't have to do that because they're, they're not really qualified to be that right. unless you yeah. make them that way, you know? And then well, why, why am I asking dietary advice from this person when they're not a dietitian? You know, it's why would I do that? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, I just think we give them way more power than they really deserve sometimes. And I think that that's where these pitfalls come from these fake instructors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. I actually went through that even myself. And it's funny because I think part of the permission is given from the student because the student is like, oh, sensei, you're, you're the best. But also, especially like even in my personal experience, the sensei was all about giving advice. And back then, I wasn't smart enough to realize and to question like, wait. So, so my favorite example is he used to give relationship advice, but he was twice divorced both for his wives left him and his third wife uh, still wasn't there yet, but eventually it was his student, which started going to school when she was 14. And he's like, you know, 40 something year old dude. And when she was like 20, they got married. So, uh, so it's, yeah, I'm like, dude, if you want to give me relationship advice, and obviously I'm speaking from my current standpoint, I didn't realize that at <laughs> that, that, that moment, but now I'm like, you should be really good at relationships. You should show a really good example of it and say, look, you know, I've been, I, I've been married for 50 years and, and we're like perfect. So I'm going to tell you my experience, but he's like, no, he's terrible. He sucks at it. Other things too, but he's all about giving advice to you. So it's like crazy, but that's my. And one last thing. little note before yeah, we sure. move forward too is yeah. uh, I, we talked about the Anderson Silva knife defense. I want to make sure I'm very clear about this. Anderson Silva can murder me with his hands. Right. Anderson Silva is an incredibly talented martial artist and one of the greatest MMA fighters of all time. And on some people's list, the greatest of all time. Right. right. But that knife defense technique that he showed is garbage. All right. Yeah. So I'm just like, you know, I'm like, I'm not the point of what the conversation was is to not give people too much power over you. And at the end of the day, if Anderson Silva can do no wrong to you, then you might really want to start second guessing your thought process when looking at people. There are right. all kinds of shades of gray to all kinds of people. I suck at a lot of things and that's okay. And Anderson Silva just happened to suck at that knife defense. It doesn't mean he's a bad martial artist. It just means that one thing that he showed is hot garbage. Uh, so to double check, so George Dillman, what's the rank of... I'm, I'm putting him at the end of the list since we're just starting. So okay, I agree so with you. I think I'm going to put him at the end of the list. Yeah, he's five. Okay, he's awesome. So we have both, both uh, number five on the same plot. So that's cool. For sure. And mostly because... I, the stuff I'm about to cover here with the, my right. particular list, I don't know right. who you have, and I'm excited to learn, are some of the most horrific acts you could possibly do. So Damn. yeah, okay, we're talking that's... everything from rape to shooting students to uh, creating religions to pedophilia. Wow. It gets bad. My my list is pretty much softcore. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some good. horrific things, but we'll we'll discuss. Okay. So, well, speaking of it, so I started off with number my number five. Turns out we have the same person, but it's still your turn. So what's your number four? Joshua Fabia. Okay. But so that, I'm not that, sure if you're... It sounds like a Brazilian jiu-jitsu name, but I may be... No. So, I... so Joshua okay. Fabia was the guru and coach of Diego Sanchez for a very right. long time. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about doing some of the weirdest things I've ever seen a coach do, for instance, and I'll send you all these videos, by the way. Yeah. But for instance, he uh, he at one point pulled out a knife, a real knife in the middle of a ring when he was doing training for multiple people. And Diego Sanchez is one of those people. And mm -hmm. his advice to people was don't get touched by the knife because everything's a knife. Everything's not a knife. But his advice was everything's a knife. And he was talking about like getting punched should be like life or death. Getting kicked is life or death. So his uh -huh. example was to pull out a real knife and to chase these people around the ring with an actual knife. Oh, well, okay. So uh, hopefully nobody got hurt. <laughs> Luckily not, but there were some people who did eventually get hurt. Like for instance, one of the, one of the last straws, I guess you could say in terms of his coaching when Diego Sanchez was about to leave him and eventually did leave his, his cult was he hung Diego Sanchez upside down and was repeatedly punching and kicking him in the head. Um, and Diego was not defending it. He's just getting hit constantly in the head, kicked in the head, and he's just sit sitting there taking it. And for some reason, his thought process was this was good for him in some way. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that he did to Diego Sanchez was he set up Diego Sanchez's OnlyFans and then was posting some very weird things. Like, for instance, Diego Sanchez in one of the videos was just stretching. And he's like, yeah, look at that sexy butt. Like, it's like, what are you talking about, man? Like, you're in charge of his OnlyFans? Found out apparently he was also in charge of running all of his social media. Um, but it gets a little weirder than that. Um, another thing that he would do is anytime Diego Sanchez at the time would go to like an interview, he would do this complete narcissistic behavior where people would try to interview Diego. They weren't trying to interview Fabio, but Fabio would force himself into the interviews. And so one of the most famous ones that I like think that people should see, as you can see, like this dude still operating a school called the School of Self-Awareness, is that he went on the Schmo show. And I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with the Schmo, but he does like a lot of interviews with like MMA fighters and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And his uh, his girlfriend, uh, Helen Yi, I do believe, is mm-hmm. also a reporter for MMA. And they do the show together. So he has Diego and Fabio on one side of the table. And then Helen is on the, I guess, the head of the table and the Schmo is on the other side. Mm-hmm. And they start talking about like, something that has to do nothing with what Fabia brings up. But then Fabia goes, you know what it's like to constantly be made fun of and ridiculed online. And so he stands up in the middle of this interview and he walks over to Helen Yi during this interview and he gets, she's sitting down and he stands right over her. I mean, like uncomfortably close. And he's like, you see how that feels? That's what I feel like all the time. And he's like, in my head, I'm like, if I was the schmo, I would punch you in your face because he's literally trying to intimidate her during this interview which right. isn't supposed to be with him. It's supposed sure. to be with Diego. Right. right. And uh, so, but he, every interview that Diego goes to, he interjects. He went into another, another interview, which by the way, wasn't a public interview. This was like a media thing where Diego Sanchez went in to discuss with some of the hires up and t- in terms of media uh, for, you know, how Diego had his thoughts and what they can do and stuff like that. It was kind of like a meeting more than anything else. And when the meeting was over, it looked like the meeting with Diego went completely fine. And Joshua Fabia was recording the entire thing. As a matter of fact, it wasn't just Fabia who was doing it. It was, uh, who was that famous for? Stefan Bonner, which by the way, Stefan Bonner was a part of the School of Self-Awareness as well. I don't know if he still is, but during that meeting, Stefan Bonner is the one recording this whole thing. Diego gets up from the table and he's done. And everybody was seemed to be very cordial and happy with what happened out of nowhere. Fabio walks in and he just goes, yeah, I want to talk to you guys for a second. And they're like, okay. Cause it has nothing to do with Fabio at all. And then he starts talking about how they're belittling him on on television, how they're making fun of him and how it's like they're ruining Diego Sanchez's career and completely going in on them. And they're like, what, are you talking about? (laughs) Like, this has nothing to do with you. Why are you even speaking? And Mm -hmm. by the way, if you guys know anything about that media team, they are all killers. Like we're talking about legit, almost all of them are fighters and good fighters at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, I do believe it was Angie Hill's first day sitting in on those meetings. (laughs) And so (laughs) it was like hell of a first day. And one last little incident that I found very crazy is Matt Sarah sitting down at lunch or breakfast with Den Thomas. They're sitting down, they're having a conversation. All of a sudden, again, here comes Fabia and Den Thomas pulls out his phone and starts recording it. And he starts like kind of talking bad to Matt Sarah. And if you know anything about Matt Sarah, he don't play that. And so Matt Sarah's like, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> like, Why are you interrupting our breakfast and being rude? Um, and so this guy has this like horrific narcissistic behavior behind his cult, which is a school of self-awareness and where he could do no wrong. Everyone else is wrong. And the techniques that he's teaching are just made up nonsense. And to my knowledge, the only real martial arts that he's trained is Sistema. And if you know anything about Sistema, it is very weird and odd in itself because Sistema has no true curriculum. And Mm -hmm. so I think that that's why Sistema in general is weird because when you have no true curriculum, people just make stuff up all the time, which is why a lot of it seems made up because it is you know Mm -hmm. yeah well it's super crazy what you just told and also looking at kind of the whole picture another kind of lesson or or thought comes up for me that diego so high level professional fighter right uh double checking uh Diego. oh yeah diego for sure absolute legend and like to to just kind of throw it out there for people who don't know diego was in the ultimate fighter one 
And out of the entire crew of the Ultimate Fighter 1, I do believe he is the only, if not one of the only, the only fighter still actually active from the Ultimate Fighter 1. Mm. So, which is very impressive. And then, but I think so what, what also makes it fascinating because like it's a little bit on the same lane of what we looked, spoke about, like Anderson Silva teaching that knife defense where we tend to like put everything in the same pot. And it's like, okay, so if this guy is an amazing fighter, clearly he will not fall for Bushido. And we kind of expect that like, oh, he knows what works. He knows what doesn't work. But yet, and yet again, there, that's a great example that even if you're good at fighting, if you know functional martial arts, that doesn't necessarily save you and prevent you from falling onto like these charlatans like you know, Fabian, uh, Fabia. And at the same time, uh, I also think a lot of people, they don't consider like, like one, one quick situation from a personal story of mine where I spoke about it on a video where I met a no touch master, essentially like Aikido guy, you know, threw me down, expected like me not to get up and long story short, you know, I, I didn't feel like getting up. It was something weird was happening, but it was no, no touch. It was more like social pressure. I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to get up like this and everyone's watching. And so I didn't get up. And then that's, you know, why no touch work. But people in the comments, they're like, oh, you should have definitely stood up and show everyone that he's, you know, he's, you should have exposed him. And I'm like, I may be, but I think people underestimate how when you, and this was just one situation, you know, out of, uh, it, it wasn't like a long story of conditioning where you are part of a culture or community and, and they condition you for a long time. And then eventually people think it's just so very easy. You come in, it's like, oh, it's either bullshit or not. But they underestimate how you can get pulled into this big narrative where even if you know what's true and what's not, you can still get fooled over a long run. And I think this is kind of a good example of that. For sure. And I think that most people like, you know, we filmed the documentary about fakes, frauds, ponies, and con men in the martial arts industry. And we filmed it last year, January through March. Uh, so three months. And during that time, we actually got to speak with a lot of psychologists and mm. cult experts, which was very eye opening for my particular job. And mm. they all agreed on three very interesting points. They said the people who are most likely to fall victim of cults, one, are well educated. And that mm. blew me away. And I was like, yeah. why is it? Well, they were like, it's an indoctrination of education because you you kind of do the thing you've always done. So imagine you're going through preschool. Then you go to kindergarten, then you go through grade school, you know, but before you're done with that, that might be 13 years, if not longer, of education. And then mm -hmm. you decided, I want to continue my education, so I'm going to be a doctor or a lawyer, something that requires a lot of schooling, another, a lot of years, right? Mm -hmm. So then you go through school again. And so the majority of your life at this point has been education. And so what happens after you're done with that? Well, you're used to that. That's what you're used to. And so you go seeking out further education. So you go find like the Tony Robbins seminar, the Gary Vee seminar, right? You need more education because that's what you're used to. That's what you like. And so you continue. But not everybody meets a Tony Robbins or a Gary Vee. Sometimes you meet a Fabia and that person comes along in your life when you're vulnerable and they can take advantage of you, which we can all be vulnerable and be, be vulnerable and be taken advantage of. A great example of that, by the way, is a documentary called Wild Wild Country on Netflix. If you get an opportunity, check it out. That cult built an entire city on their own from the ground up. It was made of doctors and lawyers and architects. These were intelligent people who were belonged to this cult. And they said the next thing is people who don't think they can fall victim of cults are most likely to fall victim of cults. Because <laughs> think about it. it. Once you put your hand on a hot stove and burn yourself, you don't do that again because you know what the, the, the thing is. You know what will happen to you. Yeah. But if you have never burned yourself before, and then you might be a little more relaxed around that kitchen a little bit. You might take a little bit more risk because you don't know what that feels like. All of a sudden you burn yourself. Well, you thought it was never going to happen to you. Mm -hmm. It happens to all of us. We eventually get burned. So knowing that keeps you a little safer. It keeps your walls up. Mm -hmm. Thinking that you're smarter than someone who is a professional con artist is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. For instance, are you a chef? Me? Well, yeah. I cook, but I'm not a chef. No. So do you think you can cook better than a chef? No. Of course not. Exactly, because they're educated. That's what they do. How about this? Right. Um, are you a financial advisor? No. So why would you think you could, do you think you could be better at giving people financial advice than a real financial advisor? No. All right. Are you a con artist? Hopefully not. <laughs> that, 
So do you think you'd be better at conning people than a con artist? Oh, of course not. Yeah, no. Exactly. So people have this mindset of this professional con artist who deals with skeptics and deals with people who don't believe them all the time, who knows all the tricks of the trade, who cons people for a living, and you really think that you're going to be better at understanding that con than they are, you're wrong. That's what they do for a living. You won't see it coming because they know the tricks of the trade in order to get you there. And so, you know, back to the Fabia thing, that's exactly what happened. This is a professional con artist who was able to infiltrate somebody at the highest levels of the UFC, who was somebody who was respected and revered as somebody who was eccentric, sure, but at least a, a about that life fighter and took advantage of him. That can happen to any of us. And to put an exclamation point at the end of me calling Fabi a horrible human being um, is that once Diego Sanchez, that video was released about Diego getting hit in the head and stuff like that. Once that video was released, not too long after that, maybe a week or two, um, all of a sudden, they, Diego announced they split from Fabia, which the everyone in the community was like, you got to get away from this guy. And he did. He split. The next day, I promise you, the next day, Joshua Fabia went on the, it was like Summer Helene show. So the Summer Helene show was a radio show. And he went on that show and it was supposed to be him and Diego. But after the split, Diego decided not to do it. But Fabio went on anyway. And the entire hour they're on there, all he did was bash Diego Sanchez the next day. Oh. And this is supposed to be somebody that you were mentoring and taking care of. Right. It made Fabio look like the most biggest piece of human garbage I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And he was putting out personal information about Diego and all kinds of stuff. It was horrible. So Fabio makes the list. And by the way, anybody, I, I never challenge people to fights, but I would fight Fabia for free. I would I would fight Fabia tomorrow. Um, I wouldn't even train for the fight. I don't think I'd have to. But then again, Fabia's like what five three hundred twenty pounds, and I'm six one two hundred pounds. So I don't think that fight would ever happen. But I would take it in a heartbeat. That yeah, was my uh, my number four, Joshua mm. Fabia. Mm. Sounds good. Uh, there's a yeah, just a couple last thoughts I wanted to add to that as well. So Stephen Hassan, you know Stephen Hassan. I don't think so. Cult, cult expert, like uh, wrote a book. Well, point my point is Stephen Hassan was also very well educated, became a cult member very deep in. Now he's like an anti cult, but again, another example. Like, so, so initially I was very shocked and surprised as well. Like, oh, educated people. But now when you said it, I was like, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so that's crazy. And, uh, yeah, and yeah. I think people have a misconception. People think that you have to be dumb and naive. I think right. that it has nothing to do with that at all. Right. It has to do with being vulnerable. And we all right. become vulnerable in our life. It just takes the right set of words and the right timing for us to fall victim of things like this. And to educate people to understand that, I think, is an important way of combating it. If you really want to stop it, education usually is king. And information is going to help people understand how not to fall victim. And I think that by just making fun of the victim and saying, oh, that they're stupid or they're naive. And first of all, it does no one any good. You're not going to get them to leave the cult by calling them stupid. It's just not going to work that way. But second of all, you think that you really are like, and you think that you're that good at being able to not be conned. I, I have an example. So we've all been conned before. And here's how it goes. When you go into a grocery store, right? What's on the outside of the grocery store? Uh, I, I'm thinking whether this is cultural or not. Uh, well, I mean, it might be, but like usually on the outer rings of the, the grocery store is usually where all the good things are, right? You have your, uh, okay, now your meat yeah. and you have your seafood and stuff like that. That's not usually on the inside aisles. Right. The inside aisles is usually where you get your junk, right? right. You get yeah. your canned yeah. goods, your Chef Boyardee's, your fruit mm -hmm. roll-ups and chips and all that stuff's on the aisles. On the yeah. outside is usually where you get your produce and things like that. So grocery stores are set up very specifically that way. Now, once you leave though, and you're about to check out, the checkout aisle has something important that most people don't pay attention to, which are the quick grab items. You look and there's sodas right there at the, at the little refrigerator that they have, or there might be packs of gum and candies and stuff like that. What people don't realize is all of that, all of those items, all of them are located inside the store usually. So like the can of soda or the bottle of soda, the two liter soda that you're about to get, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. that is going to be more expensive right there at the register than it is inside the store. Because you might buy that 
that, you know, that little handheld soda for two bucks, buck 50, whatever it may be, but you might get a whole case of them for five bucks, mm. but that was inside the store, but this one's cost you more. So anybody in their right mind who is logical would go, why would I buy this for as expensive as it is when I can get a case of them for something almost the same price? But we still fall victim of that because someone smarter than us years ago realized that if they just put that there, they can charge you more and you still will pick it up because you're too damn lazy to go back into the store and buy the case that you forgot. Or you're one of those people like, I only want one. Well, if you buy a case, you can still just pull one out of the case and still have more for later. But you've been tricked by someone who was smarter than you into spending more money and getting less. Someone tricked you into doing that. So anytime that you've ever done that, you've been fooled because you can get one candy bar for this price or a bag of candy, the same candy for something almost comparable. But people want to think that they've never been conned or had. It's <laughs> ridiculous to me. You've been fooled. I promise you. That's just one example. Hmm. And actually, the very last thing as well, you mentioned the uh, Fabia turning against uh, Diego right the next day. So looking back at my personal experience as well, like when I officially left the cult, that organization slash cult it was all about communication and conflict resolution yada yada community and then no one there was only a single person that contacted me afterwards like the next day but that was like a more new member but all the members which i knew for years and you know like my family members yada yada none of them connected with me whatsoever i'm like huh well that kind of sounds cultish <laughs> like that's a bad sign you know if you're all flowers and peace and every and spirituality when everything is good but when things go south you you become you know like that so it's a absolutely not a great and I, I, I do believe it's called excommunication right you know, once you uh one oh you're no longer a member well you're cut off like right. friends and family were cutting you off like in brazilian right. jiu-jitsu there's a really culty term called crianche or crianche yeah right and uh, basically if you just simply go train at another facility you're a yeah. traitor like what? I just went to a seminar. You and you no 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 train here no more. You gone. You no no. You know we'll come back. You you train with them now. You wanted theirs to like, dude. How culty are you? Like, yeah. who, who does that benefit? Only the leader, and that's how you can usually spot the cult. Is if the only person benefiting from whatever the action is is the leader. It's a cult. Mm, it's a good definition. Okay, I'm ready to hit my number four. So my list would not be not be complete, but it's. It's also a major player in the whole culture. Uh, Count Dante. Oh, man. <laughs> Such a good one. You know, I didn't yeah. add him to the list, but, you know, yeah. for some reason, it kind of skipped over my mind. But absolutely oh. legend in the great fake martial arts world. Well, for me, it's he was definitely a winner for the list because, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it seems to me like he's the first major fake martial arts master that is like historically described and made an influence but would you agree or do you think like i'm sure there were fake masters for eternity but he seems like this this first big name is that true off the off the top of my head like when you go back and start researching fake masters i think he was yeah. probably one of, i i can't think of anyone before him i'm sure that there are right. yeah um, but to this dude made newspapers this dude right. well funny enough he was a hairdresser Right, yeah. He, like, <laughs> he was a hairdresser, but at the same time, there's a story. I'm not sure if you wanted to touch on it or not, but it's a, it's okay. a pretty funny story where he claimed he could catch bullets. Oh, I And so he, he met with his lawyer, and he actually handed his lawyer a loaded firearm and said, shoot me, I can catch the bullet. Oh. Now, that like I'm a, not a sure that trick? it was probably it was probably just a magic trick, right? It right. was probably yeah. just like all right, well, this is blanks and you're going to shoot right. and I'm going to have, have this bullet, you know, the old school magic trick, right. but still pretty psychotic. Yeah, absolutely. For, for me, again, like one of the interesting points about him is almost this paradox that from what I know about his history is he, again, also trained boxing, I think, like he had experience and, or, and for sure he later became upset about karate not being functional and apparently did like full contact uh, sparring and tournaments and in my book I, I think like okay well maybe that's hardcore but it's like okay sounds like he's a legit guy but then apparently he ends up creating his own style and a kata which if you learn you become like a deadly killer and i'm like if you're against like 
if you want to teach proper fighting and then you develop a kata and expect people to learn to fight for you, it's like, how, how does that work? I, I don't know. Uh, did you ever think about that as well? Or So you mentioned that and it's like almost like we're giving a master class on some of the most famous frauds in this. Right, but yeah. if, if the kata you're talking about is called kata Dante. He okay. named it after himself. <laughs> and so and you'll see this. Um, you'll see this with Ashita Kim, who is another mm-hmm. fraud, by the way, who did not make my list. Maybe we'll talk about him later. But he yes. apparently st- says that he studied directly under Count Dante. Oh, and Ashita Kim believes that he could dodge bullets. We have him on camera saying that he believes he could dodge bullets. <laughs> he believes in the death touch. Um, he believes in some really ridiculous things. But the kata that he did, and you can look this one up, and God, I hope you show this video. Sure. It's yeah. like this kata Dante thing, uh, like the dance of death or whatever he calls it. Uh-huh. It's like it's 92 most deadly, obviously I'm paraphrasing because uh, I don't remember it word for word, but like the most deadly techniques known to man. And it's just him like flailing at the guy. And then he's like stepping on him. But apparently that came directly from Count Dante. Oh, um wow. But Count Dante also, this is there's news articles that you could find about this still um, out there. It's like the Chicago Sun Times or something like that, mm-hmm. where they had a dojo storm and right. someone literally got stabbed with a sword during these like dojo storms. Sword. Okay. Yes. Wow. Because yeah, <laughs> that's you. what I, I wanted to bring up as well. Like, like how epic, and obviously we're talking about you know, really bad consequences. So there's only so much that a joke can be made out of that. But like looking at the whole story of him, it's it's such an epic martial arts story. It's almost like sounds like a movie, you know, Joe Dojo storming, teaching like deadly techniques, and 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 you know he made those comic book ads or something where he's like wrote that he's like the best. Or I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I, uh, Count Dante really seemed to love Count Dante. <laughs> so like, um, also he's a hairdresser, right? So this right. dude's like professional hairdresser look at them like i'm one to talk right but i have scars on my face so i can't grow facial hair right here because of my cleft lip and palate right this is not purposeful this is something i was born with count dante chose his hairstyle <laughs> like if you look <laughs> at his beard it is there's something going on there i now i do give him credit it was a really good way to market himself because it was very unique look but at the same time it's like a hairdresser slash martial arts instructor is like a made for TV movie. Like it's something right. that I think like it would be a great movie to watch the story of Count Dante, not that just a documentary, but like a doc biopic. Like someone I, plays someone so like Brad Pitt plays Count Dante. Right. <laughs> I hope that's a, such a good idea. I hope one day that movie comes out. I wouldn't be surprised if it would. It's 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 a fun story for her for movie. And uh, yeah, hypothetical question. So because he's in the books of knowledge and and history records, he seems like one of the first big major fake martial arts, uh, like typical mastery to make it. Do you think he may have influenced a whole generation of others who like looked and said, hey, that's smart? Or what's your guess? Absolutely. I mean, uh, look at, uh, again, look at Ashida Kim. Ashida Kim is also another very big fraud. And his influence is directly from Count Dante. And that's something that he brings up quite often. And he's proud of that fact. And right. Ashita Kim, again, goes on to be a major fraud in his own right, directly because of uh, Count Dante. So mm-hmm. these people definitely influence other people. Also keep in mind that Count Dante was apparently the founder of the Black Dragon Fighting Society. Mm-hmm. And so because of this made up organization now there are members of this organization who are still around today of the black wow. dragon fighting society so if you like look into it the cult still exists even outside of him mm-hmm. um even after his passing and so you know it's passed down from generation to generation it's nothing new but it is interesting to me that one man's influence can affect thousands and thousands and thousands of people over the course of many 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 d- generations it's a it's a, a very odd thing because looking back, any sane human being would look at this and go, that is utterly ridiculous. Yeah. But like we talked about before, anybody could be taken advantage of, you know, mm-hmm. like there are people still today who will quote the like when they're giving self-defense advice, like your uncle Steve, you know, at the family barbecue will start quoting Roadhouse. Like, if you smash a man's knee in, he can't fight anymore. But then we have all this evidence of, like, oblique kicking in the UFC, not breaking anyone's legs at all. 
<laughs> it's like these are trained fighters who are purposely stomping someone's knee for the sake of hurting that knee and still can't do it. And you think that Uncle Steve, who drinks seven packs of beer every day and watches and quotes Roadhouse, is going to be the guy to give you that self-defense advice. It's kind of the equivalent with Count Dante. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking of kind of masters influencing each other, that also made me think about a website I analyzed once where it's, and, and it actually features one of the masters I will bring up later, but it has a lot of these clearly fake martial arts masters. They have all these grand soke and grand master of grand masters. They, they all have these titles and apparently they're all connected. They all belong to the same organization and they all like support each other. And I heard, and you would often see lists. They have like 20 black belts and a same person thinks like, how can you get like 20 black belts in your whole life? It's, you know, it's impossible literally. But then I heard someone tell me that apparently they would give it to give out black belts to each other, like honorary. I'm like, oh, I'm 10th Dan in jiu-jitsu, so I'm going to give you an 8th Dan in jiu-jitsu. So it's crazy. I, I don't know. Did you bump into that yourself as well? Yeah, for sure. That will, I think that you usually see, like, it's not hard to find those particular organizations because they usually fall under um, Hall of Fame. Sorry, I apologize. It skipped me. Huh? So if you look into, like, I'm a martial arts Hall of Fame member, <laughs> usually when you find that and go to the organization, you can find a whole bunch of frauds all together. It's not hard to find because there is no universal martial arts hall of fame. There are like hundreds of martial arts hall of fames. And usually they're good old boy systems where they're buddy, buddy with each other. And they basically are just giving each other these certifications. So that way they can just have them, you know? And, uh, you know, the only one that I actually respect for martial arts hall of fames that seems to be the most credible is like century martial arts does like the martial arts super show. And every year they give out a lifetime achievement award. That would be like the only one that I really say like I can respect because they don't just give it out all the time. It's not something that's quarterly. It's something that you really do have to earn. And the people who belong in that particular organization or that particular Hall of Fame, most of them have earned their stripes. They they put in the time, the work. They really did affect the organ the martial arts community as a whole in a positive way, you know. And uh, it's I, like I saw Chuck Norris receive his lifetime achievement award. You know, I saw Dan and Asanto receive his Lifetime Achievement Award. Right. And, you know, this year, Cynthia Rothrock is receiving her Lifetime Achievement Award. Mm -hmm. You know, these are people who made actual impacts in the community. But then you have, like, I'll just make up a name, like the old Steve Jimbo Grandmaster right. Sophie so-and-so right. receives his Lifetime Achievement Award. Like, right. isn't that dude, like, 30? <laughs> like, he received right. a Lifetime yeah. Achievement Award, huh? Like, okay, right. that's strange. You know, you're the Hall of Fame master. You're like in the Hall of Fame. Which one? <laughs> like, right. Those organizations are a dime a dozen. So whenever I see like Martial Arts Hall of Fame and I've never heard of you before, yeah. big red flag. Yeah, 100%. So I think Count Dante, pretty, he, he's endless. We should make a whole video about him, but, but I, I feel we covered him uh, fairly well. What's your number three? Uh, well, I guess it's still technically my number four. Uh, because oh, we wait. both agreed on Dillman. So okay, that was yeah, your okay. four. Okay. And uh, my four would be a guy named Jeff Prather. Uh -huh. So I don't know if you've ever heard of Jeff Prather or not, but I have a laundry list of things that are utterly insane that this man has done. So Jeff Prather was a DEA agent. He worked for the DEA. When he was working for the DEA, he got removed from the DEA because he broke like five different laws under the DEA, DEA rules. He mm -hmm. was taking vehicles that he was not allowed to take off site and using them for himself. He was taking firearms off site without getting permission and using them to teach people uh, firearm safety stuff and all that. Didn't get permission. Uh, he did other things, but the, one of the most egregious acts that he did, which is very telling, is that one, he's a 15th degree black belt under the Bujin Khan. Oh, okay. Now, you heard that correctly 15th degree black right. belt. Right. And so if anybody knows anything about the Bujin Khan, Hatsumi Sensei is the leader of the Bujin Khan. He's the guy who looks like a clown, old man, purple yeah. hair. Right. And Hatsumi Sensei at one time seemed to be a legitimate martial artist and he developed his style and all that good stuff. And just like a lot of other people, eventually goes crazy. And he decides that, you know what? 10 degrees, nah, man, we're going to go up to 11. And so he did that. He incorporated that. So in the Bujin Khan, you can get an 11 degree black belt. Then after that, he was like, you know what? 11 degrees we can go better. Let's do 12. So he instilled 12. And then out of nowhere, he's just like, you know what? We could do better. 15th degrees, right? Now, to give you a little bit more background on why Jeff Prather is also has to be a crazy person is the fact that in order to become an instructor 
and the Bujin Khan. You have to go through something called the Saki test. Mm. This is something that Jeff Prather would have had to do under this organization, which is you get down in like a Seiza position on your knees or you go crisscross on your, on your, your butt. And then you sit there while an instructor has like a Shinai and, or a, any type of like a, a, a sword that's not going to hurt you when it hits you. Right. And they bring it up over their head and they're trying to whack you in the head when you can't see them. So you're looking straight in a room full of your peers and you're supposed to sense, which by the way, if you look into Saki a little bit, it's like a evil intent or harmful intent. Mm. And so again, paraphrasing, and you're supposed to sense the intent, literally how they define it, not hear the person, not feel the mat, not look at other people's facial expressions in the crowd, literally supposed to sense their intent. And you're supposed to dodge out of the way. I'm sorry to tell you, but if I take a sword and I stand behind you and I go to whack you in the head, you're not dodging anything. You're getting whacked in the head every time I do it because you cannot sense what's going on. You will just get whacked. Either you got lucky and rolled out of the way and guessed, or you got whacked in the head. Even further than that, the Saki test seems to be a test that is rigged. If, if Hatsumi Sensei does not want you to pass, he cracks you on the head. If he huh. wants you to pass, he will hold the sword back a little bit or make a bigger movement. And all of this stuff we have on tape, so I'll make sure I send that stuff to you. But it's a rigged test. And so yeah. Jeff Prather had to go through that test. Then while he was for, in the DEA, um, one of the things that he did was he raped two women. And, and the police report or the DEA report describes this as very violent, violent sexual rape. Now, the thing was is that he made his own religion. Yes, he did. That's right. He actually developed his own religion. And during that time, he was talking to these two women, and apparently they were both having issues with their relationships. One of which, by the way, the woman's husband apparently was, I guess, no longer having sex with her. Um, and so because of that, he told her, well, you know, in order to heal your relationship, you have to go under this thing that he calls verbatim in his religion, sexual healing. And in order to fix their relationship, she had to have sex with him in order to fix whatever was going on. And mm -hmm. ac according to the report, both cases wind up being rape. Now, gets even crazier. When he set up his own religion, he had students because he's a martial arts instructor. And we'll get into his conspiracy theory stuff later, but he's a martial arts instructor. So he had a student who was married to someone. Jeff Prather convinced that student to allow Jeff Prather to marry the student's wife. And then on top of that, all of this is documented, by the way, then on top of that, once he had convinced the student to allow him to marry his wife, then he turns around and hires that same student to be a preacher in his church. So he takes his wife and then gives him work. <laughs> How crazy is that? When you dig into like some of these people, you have to remember that not all of these problems are specifically martial arts related. A lot of these problems are they are in positions of power in the martial arts industry, and they're using that to take advantage of people. So mm -hmm. let's say hypothetically, right, regardless of technique, let's say his technique was fantastic. Look at all the other crazy things we just talked about. And would that still be OK with you? Because I think in, in the industry, a lot of people really think that if you're just good at martial arts, then everything else is OK. Like the only thing that's a problem is if your technique is bad. If your technique is good, then everything else is okay. It's not. Mm. Just because you have a black belt does not mean you have some type of moral compass, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, I understand. I think that uh, black belt syndrome, again, listening to all these stories, it just because I went through that experience, essentially, I can always find similarities. And in that case as well, I mentioned my Aikido instructor who was getting uh, relationship advice. Same was with everything. And the only education he had, I know, well, he, he studied in a university for like two years and quit the university to pursue martial arts. So, but that's the only uh, degree, that's the only education he had. But then he would give financial advice. He would give business advice. He would like, whoever he would meet, he would speak to that person like, like as he knows that, like he would meet a musician and he'd be like, oh yeah, music is very much like this and that. And it's like, Dude, and then when eventually I kind of woke up and realized how nonsense that is, I became super <laughs> cautious and so aware of why do I believe that I know what I know? And uh, before making any claim to consider, okay, how well educated am I in this subject? Because I think, also, well, thick martial arts masters and these delusional people, they fall hard for that, but we all fall for that 
to some degree where it's like, oh yeah, everybody knows that you eat two spiders or like five spiders on average while you're sleeping. It's like, no, it's a, you know, urban myth, but we tell to each other as truth because, you know, somebody told us or it's like, oh, this diet is great. How do you know that? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, for sure. Like the old Frank Duke stuff, you know, I don't know if he's on right. your list, but I'm, I, if I had to guess, he'd probably make your list, but when it, it comes was to close. like, it was close, it was close. So well, it was close. well, he's not on my list, but he is one of the, the more like, you know, he's one of the more famous ones because, you know, he was able to infiltrate Hollywood with his made up exactly. nonsensical story. And right. the funny thing about that, like, you know, some people who really believe him, um, who really believe that he really went to this Kumite that does not exist. They but really believe yeah, they still believe it. Like right, okay. they, he even perpetuated this and he like other fake martial artists also say they went to a similar kumite. Like there's a, there's another martial artist out there who agreed like, yes, I was also in the kumite. Like <laughs> you're the only two people on the planet who actually attended this thing. But if you listen to Frank Dukes tell it, like we're talking utter nonsense. Like him saying that he knocked people out. By the way, when he was supposedly in the kumite, we're talking like the movie Bloodsport came out in the 80s, right? Yeah. Um and so th that means that his story would have had to happen before that. And so he claims that he knocks somebody out in point something seconds. It's like, how did you record that? Like, <laughs> what device did you really use to actually be able to clock stop this yeah. thing that is in a secret kumite that apparently had really no technology around to be able to do that because that's not how the tournament was set up. Also, the egregious things that he said about him knocking out X amount of people in the tournament, you know, it's like, all right, so this is a single elimination tournament. You're claiming to have knocked out this many people in one tournament. The number that he gave, technically, that tournament would still be going on today because of, it doesn't make any sense for a single elimination tournament for him to have knocked out this many people. Or my favorite, for him to say that the sword that he got for winning the Kumite, he wound up saving orphan children or, or, people, or kids who were being human trafficked on the high seas by trading the sword. It's like... This guy really believes this. And what's even crazier is that over the years, I do believe that he probably was aware that this was a lie. But I think that over the years, he probably has slowly convinced himself that all of this is utterly true. Because in order to be a good liar, you have to believe the lie. And so I think that that creates this delusion. And you were talking, the reason I brought him up, right? well, specifically because... You know, you hear all these rumors and stories and there are people out there who believe blood sports a real thing that it really happened when it didn't, yeah. you know, it's yeah. okay. Well, people believe that just because the story's circulating. When I was a kid, I believed it happened because I didn't know any better. I was a child when I watched that movie and I was like, right. oh, granted, give it credit. Blood sport was a cool movie. I like watching the movie, but I watch sure. it for what it is, a fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah actually, I can uh, even concur like what, what you said uh i was wa i'm watching this series of stuntmen react where they look at stuff and they react to stuff and i, w I don't think it was blood sports but it brought up frank dukes and uh, the guy the stunt, stunt guy who was really cool like down to earth you know I, I saw many videos with him and he says oh yeah well frank dukes he went to this uh tournament and like a single elimination and he won and th then eventually he went and made the movie and he was like the choreographer choreographer and like, damn, this guy is cool. But he just never stopped to think, wait, why did I believe this to be true? But as he said, like, he's a literal example of that. He heard somebody told him and he's like, he tells everybody else and without any ill intention. But then somebody watches that and they're like, oh, look, the stun guy said it's true. It must be true. And then, you know, it just keeps getting worse and worse. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely crazy. But uh, yeah, that's my number four is Jeff Prather. And like I said... If you look into it, man, I'll, I'll give you all the, the stuff so you could post it up. But if you look into it, his story is absolutely insane. And by the way, just a final note on Jeff Prather yeah. is apparently now he is an extremely popular conspiracy theorist who has like a show that he does to talk about conspiracy theories. Um, <sighs> yeah, so it yeah, is. Wow. And people believe like people still follow this man. People like respect him for some reason. It's like you can just look at the proof. By the way, if any of the things I said are incorrect, right? Yeah. If they're slander or they're liable, why haven't I been sued? Oh, yes, because I have evidence. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'll add my last point here as well. It's, it's, it's interesting. It seems like there are many universal qualities that these fake masters have. Like they have a lot of things in common, like they love their titles and they love their inflated stories. They're also multi-talented. 
like they're usually like well countante hairdresser and martial artist but this is like not the worst case usually it's like oh he's like a you probably have better examples than I do. Bro. Oh, dude. Yeah. Like I, I get what you're saying by multi-talented because like, for instance, if you're looking in places like India, for instance, yeah. um, you know, they're doctor so-and-so PhD with a whole bunch of other letters behind their name. And they claim yeah. to be all these things like, you know, especially in India, you'll see this a lot where someone claims to be a doctor. They'll claim to be an actor. They'll claim, claim to be a stunt person. They claim to be a martial arts instructor. They claim to be a guru. They claim to be a chef. They claim to be an airline pilot. You know, they try to be all of these things. I'm a, I wrote a book and I did all these things. Right. It's like, at the end of the day, like most of you were just full of it. Um, right. And I think the problem is, is that people feel the need to add on to their resume in the martial arts industry when it's not really needed. Right. It's okay to have one black belt and one thing and to have one skill and be good at it. Yeah. It's okay to have, uh, you know, a taste of everything and then being able to bring those experiences. What's not okay is to just lie blatantly about your fight record, to lie blatantly to your students about your belt rank, to lie about your history. Because what that winds up doing is if you're willing to lie about those particular things, which is usually the first conversation you have with your instructor. When you walk in, oh, well, my experience is this, or you look online and you can see their resume. If you're just honest with your students, to be, in my personal opinion, that's okay. For instance, if you're a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and you decide to open up a school, are you going to be the best? Absolutely not. There's still a lot more for you to learn. Are you going to be one of those people that's going to be able to be the best instructor for them? No, because in all honesty, no one is the best instructor. There will always be someone better than you at something. So all you can do is just do the best you can. But if you're honest with your student, that allows them the opportunity to make their own decisions as an adult. If I walk up to you and you go, yeah, man, I've been training for a year. I'm a blue belt. I'm a good blue belt. I'm a competitive blue belt, but I'm only a blue belt. If mm -hmm. you'd like to sign up here, I know I can teach you some things. Um, yeah. If they're a white belt and they've never trained before. If not, that's okay too. I would respect that person well more than I would respect somebody who blatantly lied about their resume in order to get people into their gym. Yeah, 100%. So, okay, number three. Uh, shall I jump in? Oh, yeah, it's all you, brother. You're up. Well, so my number three is not going to take a lot, a lot of time, I think. Uh, and I really doubt if that person is on your list because he's a local celebrity. Oh, <laughs> okay. Country. Yeah, it's a country known as Lithuania. Uh, not everybody has ever bumped into it, but it's a country in Eastern Europe, which gives a lot of space for Bushido especially the ties with Russia. And I think Russia is quite, quite fond of their fake martial arts masters. You know, they have Sistema, <laughs> and which they're proud of. But so the master is uh, Vladimir Lysissin. He is a, I believe at the moment, he's a 12th degree Aikido black belt or okay. higher, which, which as an Aikido black belt myself, the fact is 10 is the biggest one. And even if you have a 10th one, it's questionable. There are some super high level whole lifers who train that kid for their whole lives and they have a ninth degree given to them just before death or after death. And he's a 12th degree Aikido <laughs> you know, master. Uh, right. He's also a uh, Hall of Famer, which I'm glad you mentioned because you know that's the red flag. He's like, it's written on his website. It's like, he is part of the 100 greatest senseis in the world and i looked for that list and i'm not really sure where that list exists he's also a member of the spetsnaz global a, a some martial art created created for the russian special forces which again i did not find any evidence that it exists i only found some seminars like a couple of seminars that happened where he was part of that's it and he also created the national traditional martial art of Lithuania, which is essentially Aikido. And he actually made it like legit. He, he like got the papers like, and so it officially exists. And it looks like Aikido, but they dress up with traditional Lithuanian clothes when they perform their demos. So fascinating guy. And the worst case is, as with many of these fake senseis, he has a lot of schools, like uh, through the whole country, there are quite a few schools He has a lot of instructors, uh, they're pricey. And I met some people who were part of the community. They were students, 
They still respect him. Maybe they had some doubts about him, but most of them, you know, they went there, studied for a couple of years, left, and didn't even realize that he's a fraud. So that's my number three. And the justification why it's a number three, it's primarily because he's the first fake martial arts master that I learned about in my life. When I was still studying Aikido, people would tell me like, hey, did you hear about that guy? And smart people would laugh from him and vice versa. But uh, yeah, I think he, he deserved a part in my list. But I don't know, sure. how does that sound <laughs> to you? You know, it's, it's very common for a lot of these martial arts frauds to actually have bigger organizations, a lot, which will bring me to my, my number one um, and my number two and on my list. Um, those particular gentlemen had major organizations. And mm. I think the thing is, is that martial arts is very convoluted to people who are not in martial arts. For instance, like there are so many different versions of karate that when someone says karate to me, I say, which one? There are so many different versions of Indonesian Salat. When they say Salat, I say, which one? But I think that a lot of people who aren't martial artists don't understand that there are so many. Like there is a major difference between something like a traditional Okinawan Shoin Ru and a Kyokushin karate. They're not the same. They're much different in the way that they handle what they do and their rule sets and things like that in competition. But when it comes to these kind of people, I think because martial arts is so difficult for people to understand, because there are all kinds of different backgrounds, there's all kinds of different names. For instance, if I were to go to a school, some people go by the term professor or sifu or sensei. Like they're all the same thing, but to someone who's not in the martial arts industry, those words might sound like they're different things. They're really not. They just come from different arts. And so that, con- that, that makes martial arts extremely hard to understand for people who aren't in martial arts. They don't know the lingo. They don't know that there are different backgrounds to all of these things and lineages and histories and standards. Like some schools you bow at the door. Some schools you only bow at the mat. Some schools you don't bow at all. Some schools have pictures of the entire lineage on the wall. Some people have just the master who came before on the wall. Some people have nothing on the wall. Why? And so when you're going into a martial arts facility that you know nothing about, you're putting a lot of confidence in the fact that the person in front of you is just being honest to you. You don't know if they are. It's kind of like going to a mechanic. I'm not a mechanic, but if my mechanic went up to me and said, yeah, you need this fixed, this fixed, and this fixed, I would just believe him. And then he would fix it even if he didn't need to and charge me a bunch of money. That's that's something that is very historical in people getting ripped off is by mechanics, right? Um, And so I think that that makes it so much easier for martial arts instructors to manipulate people because you're the first person they're coming to with this information. So they're a blank canvas. They have no clue what's going on. So when they walk in, they're just trusting that what you're saying is true. Even if you've made it all up, there's no global organization that monitors and regulates all martial arts. It does not exist. There is no standard for opening up a martial arts studio. There is nobody who's going to do checks and balances on you if you're lying to people, except for me (laughs) and like a couple other guys out there, you know? So like, because of that, anybody can just open up a school and just lie to people. And sometimes they get away with this for a very long time. Mm. Um, And just to add one example to that, I covered Mm. a story about a martial arts school in South Africa. And if you remember South, South Africa had the apartheid. And so during that time, anything that pretty much wasn't white, wasn't going into the country like Mm. it was like really grotesque what they were doing down there and so Mm. but because of that a lot of other cultures were not able to make it in so brazilian jiu-jitsu was not a thing that was coming into the country at that time but there was a guy who opened up a brazilian jiu-jitsu school and he had it for over 30 years he himself had absolutely no black belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu whatsoever and as a matter of fact the techniques that he was teaching was jiu-jitsu, but he had no actual authority to give rank at all. So he decided that since that was the case, that he would start giving out rank in jiu-jitsu anyway. And he did so for over 25 years. Some of these kids started when they were five with him. They grew up to be an adult. He winds up putting out a memo one day. It's a four-page memo. By all means, if you want to look at the craziness that this is, I did a story called The House That Mike Built. And In that particular story, he had a four-page memo that went out to all of his his, uh, black belts, calling them all kinds of names under the sun, uh, telling them that if they didn't, like, come and do something specific for him, that he would be taking away their rank. 
Well, some of those students thought that that was a very weird and atrocious memo that they received. Turns out he wasn't even allowed to give rank in the first place. He had no Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt at all. And so like sometimes you can get away with this lie for a really long time if you don't have that outside information coming in. And cults are really good about isolating you away from outside information. Right. My number two yeah. um, is uh, James Hydrick. Uh, so, uh, wait, let me check my list. <laughs> <I keep laughs> listing up his name. Yep. Okay, you just got my number one. <laughs> so, oh, really? Okay, well, he's yeah, my number yeah. two. Um, okay, close but, enough, close enough. But you, you have give to. information if you're not familiar with James Hydrick. At one time, James Hydrick was honestly considered the world's greatest psychic. There was a news article out there with him called The World's Greatest Psychic. James Hydrick was such a good con artist that he was able to fool scientists. They sat him down and they started doing tests and he fooled scientists. One of the ways that he fooled them was they hooked him up to see if his hand would emit chi or electrical energy or they could figure out if they could measure it. So they hooked him up to a machine to see if he could like actually put out some type of energy. Well, he knew that he was in a position that, oh, my God, I'm going to get caught. And he was nervous. So the type of pants that he had on, I guess, would conduct static electricity. And he wasn't aware of that. So he was nervous. And so he started like rubbing the sweat off of his hands onto his pants. And I guess that was helping like condu- like make some static electricity happen. Right. And so when he wind up waving his hand at the machine, it actually registered. And he at the moment, he was like, oh, shit, it's my pants. And so he kept <laughs> doing it and kept registering, which I thought was an insane story. Um, yeah. And then he said, like, one of the things that he was good at was the trick that he would do is he would put a pencil kind of on the edge of a table and he would look like he was moving the pencil with his mind, which it was just a, a trick that he would do by blowing air out of his mouth unnoticed. Well, then, of course, and the, there's a very famous photo of this as well, sitting in a chair where they actually are covering his mouth to see if they could feel any air. And they're watching him like a hawk to see if, they, that he'd be, if he's blowing air. Well, he was able to blow air in such a way that it would go straight down, hit the table and go across the table and still move the pencil. Which and they still, were baffled. Still pretty impressive. I mean, the guy. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> he's a A1 magician for sure. The dude's right. an impressive magician. And so, but on the other hand, when it comes to the other things that he was doing at one point in time, I think he had over 2000 students in his martial arts facility and his martial arts facility was so big. It was actually in an airplane hangar. It's a massive oh, wow. studio that he had. Oh, wait. Um, so also, I thought for a moment, like 2,000 students, like in the country, but no, it's like 2,000 in a single area, like place, location, right? Crazy. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And there, you can go and look at videos um, of like him actually teaching students in this airplane hangar where he's having them all lay down and convincing them that they can move the bags um, in, the, in the room uh, with their mind. Uh, but James Hydrick also did some really crazy things. So like, for instance, um, in 1977, he kidnapped and tortured a guy. Um, he was arrested for that. Um, this was this is something that was really horrific. And I don't even want to talk about it because of how gross it is. But they did him and other people were involved in this. He was arrested three times other than that. And he escaped prison three times. Which is, again, impressive. One back to our question, uh, the torture... I don't, again, I don't, I don't know if this information I'll put on record, but very curious to ask, what's the reason for kidnapping? Was it just like sadistic pleasure or? Uh, something like that. So to my knowledge, and again, this is, you know, feel free to go back and research this because off sure. the top of my head, I don't know it yeah. verbatim, but to, from what I remember, him and a group of other people were driving in a van. They found a person, grabbed the person, threw him into the back of the van. They all gang raped him and tortured him and then threw him out of the van. Um, um but you have to remember, James Hydrick is, is kind of a sad case. Like when James Hydrick was a child, this is documented as well, um, out of his own parents' mouth. But when James Hydrick was a child, he was considered the family dog. And they tied him to a tree and they forced him to eat outside. And they didn't even give him a real name. They just called him Spot. And uh, they, he was abused and tortured as a child. And so he, was, he went to a school at the time that he was put into a school for... Uh, mentally handicapped children. Him himself was not mentally handicapped. And so, of course, he got picked on and teased by kids in the neighborhood because he was one of the kids that went to that school. Um, You know, he ran away from home. He winds up going on the road. He winds up seeing magicians on TV. And he starts looking up to these magicians because they had all these captive audiences of people who love them. 
he starts picking up on these tricks, but he really got his start in prison. So when he was in prison, he was one day he was like reading a book. And when he was reading the book, he took a sigh and he went. And when he did that, a page of the book folded over and it was like, huh. And so while he was in prison, he had nothing else to do. So we started practicing this and pretending that he had magic powers. And him himself, through his own words, says that he converted a lot of people to Christianity because of that in prison, because he would take that and say that it was from the Lord, that he had this magic power to be able to move pages of a book with his mind. I mean, that's pretty crazy stuff, but that was where he started. And then over time, he started to like look up to people like Bruce Lee. And if you look at a lot of pictures of James Heydrich online, a lot of pictures are verbatim the same poses that Bruce Lee was doing. So like if you put them up side by side as a comparison, you'll see James Heydrich really did try to emulate Bruce Lee, which let's be honest, a lot of people in that time were trying to do the same thing. He wasn't the only sure. one, yeah. um, you know, but after he escaped prison, you know, three times in a row, um, then eventually he was able to get free. He, he was able to have his freedom. So he opened up his martial arts school. He was able to um, show that he had all these magical powers. He even fooled the Prince of Egypt. He went to Egypt and convinced royalty that he was able to stop the wind with his with his powers so he fooled scientists he fooled royalty was considered the greatest psychic of all time uh and then he went on a show uh with the amazing randy and he went on this 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 show i don't remember the name of the show off the top of my head but it was televised for people to see and he winds up doing the trick where he can move pages of a phone book by using his mind or his cheat James Randi spent his entire life as a magician uh, and then spent the other half of his life as someone who debunked people for a living. Rest in peace. He passed away a few years ago. Um, but James Randi goes, I know how he's doing it. And so he puts packaging peanuts, packing peanuts around the book and says, now do it without moving the peanuts. And of course, Hydric can't do it. And he winds up getting busted. Later on down the road, though, unfortunately, James Hydric winds up molesting five children. And he winds up getting arrested for this. And he's still in a psychiatric mental institution today. And chances are good he's probably never really getting out. Now, last little note about Hydric. Hydric, during his heyday, after he gets busted by the amazing Randy, he has a documentary that's made about him. And that documentary is like, I think if I remember, like 45 minutes to an hour long. And another magician interviews him, who is also a very well-to-do magician. And then in that interview, James Hydrick winds up admitting that it was a fraud, admitting that, you know, in that interview that he knew no martial arts, that all the martial arts he learned was off of TV, admitting that all the mind powers is just a trick, right? And he admits all this on television. So his case is so unique because out of all the frauds, he's the only one who admits that it was a con. Hmm. Wow. Well, yeah, one of the reasons I put him as my number one is because of you know, the horrific things he did. And in particular, I was thinking about the kids. I also think that's an example of how wrong things can turn and how these fake masters can actually abuse the power. And I think they're probably pretty much always abuse that power, either for financial gains or like, so for social favors. But it's a clear example that it can go even further to this nasty stuff. And I, I don't think it's necessarily exclusive to martial arts. But clearly, martial arts and being in a superior position, being famous, being respected, it can. And I, I think actually release a bunch of these videos as well about uh, martial arts masters and instructors abusing their power for like sexual favors and et cetera. So it's probably not like an uncommon thing, is it? No, it's super common. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I could do a story and feel free. Anybody wants to test this out. You're more than welcome to do so, because it doesn't matter when you see this video and try this. But if you wind up typing in martial arts arrested, martial arts abuse, karate instructor, molested, things like that into Google, you will find almost without a doubt within the last two weeks, a martial arts instructor has molested a child. Wow. There are so many of these stories that I try to put out that I almost have a hard time keeping up with it, having the time to be able to do all these stories. I even put out a video one time of, it was, uh, by the way, this was not a video I compiled. There was something else called martial arts truth or truth about martial arts on weebly.com or something like that. Whoever runs that page, please contact me because I would love to pick your brain about what you've put out there. Now, whoever runs that page, that particular person just hates martial arts in general. 
I don't. I think that there's some benefit to it. But they keep like this track, this list of all these people who have molested kids in the martial arts industry. And they released a video on YouTube that was an hour and a half long of nothing but like uh, news videos, like news reports of martial artists molesting children. It's an hour and a half long. And so like, I remember doing a story and I got so fed up with like covering these stories that I was like, you know what, I'm going to re-release that on my channel just because of how important it really is for people to see. And it's an hour and a half long video of nothing but back to back to back to back, like 30 second to minute clips of Man. martial arts instructors molesting children. It is insane to me how many there are. And just to add to that point, what baffles me about the martial arts industry, it hurts me to my core is that people will fight over the most petty, stupid shit in martial arts. They'll be like, oh, that's not a real martial art because it's not what I do. Oh, you do Taekwondo? That's ridiculous. You should do jujitsu, the real martial art. Or they'll go, oh, how long did it take you to get your belt? Oh, it took you three years to get your black belt? That doesn't count. Meanwhile, they'll defend somebody like BJ Penn who got his black belt in three years. You know, it's like, well, his, oh, well, it's because he did what you do, not because of what they do, right? And so... They'll argue over how much martial arts classes cost, how long it takes to get a belt, if someone's technique is good enough. But they'll completely ignore things like extortion and murder and rape and never bring that conversation to the table. They'll only argue about petty things, and that destroys the industry. It's toxic. And if we actually put out stories as a community to fight against these type of real egregious frauds, and stop infighting about stupid things that don't actually affect you, then maybe the martial arts industry would grow. Maybe we'd affect more people in a more positive way. Maybe it wouldn't be as toxic. Maybe we'd have less people raping children in our industry. Maybe. But instead, people would rather argue about stupid shit that doesn't actually affect anyone in their day-to-day. -day. I have some ideas and opinions of why that happens, but you know, you're the professional here. So, so what's your consensus of so why it's so common that these things happen in martial arts, the, the whole toxic thing? Um, one, I think there's a lot of ego in martial arts industry. I think that a lot of people who join martial arts specifically are starting off from a position of weakness, and then all of a sudden they get a position yeah. of power. For instance, like the people who usually win the lottery usually wind up being broke as shit right. only a couple of years later because yeah. they weren't used to having money. And then all of a sudden they have money and they don't know what to do with it. So they overspend and don't respect it. Well, it's right. the same thing with confidence. If you go your entire life with no confidence and all of a sudden somebody gives you an, like a ton of confidence and you all of a sudden have power over your life and you can defend yourself and you know you can beat people up. I mean, that's a that's a reason that I think a lot of the old school martial arts masters really put in a lot of emphasis on respect and and other things other than just fighting, because when you get all of this power, all of a sudden you get all of this like confidence all of a sudden and you're not used to it, you might not know how to use it. And a lot of times people take advantage of people with it. You know, it all becomes about you now. It all becomes about you being in charge and it all becomes about what you're getting out of the deal. You've now become a cult leader at that point. You're no longer doing this for the benefit of others. You're doing it for the benefit of you. And if you step on other people and you destroy other people's lives, for some reason, that doesn't seem to matter to you as long as you're getting something out of the deal. And I think that martial arts, again, is not regulated in any way. And so because of that, anybody can join. And so also because of that, predators are going to go where prey is. So, for instance, pedophiles know that there's no real checks and balances here, so I'll just be around a, a, a job where I have a lot of kids around me, and then they take advantage of that. Or people who have major ego issues, like I recently covered a story um, of a martial arts instructor who was stalking and harassing a woman, and the powers that be can clearly see that this is a clean-cut case of harassment and stalking, but yet they do absolutely nothing about it. Um, it's, it's almost like perpetuating a cycle of real evil shit. Because people are just turning a blind eye. Um, an example of that is if I, here you go, here's an example. A lot of people in the martial arts industry say, well, I'm just going to ignore all the negativity and I'm only going to worry about my students and making my students better. And that's the way I'll make the world a better place. And I go, okay, well, I, let's, let's break that down. So let's say martial arts itself was a giant building, like a skyscraper. And you walked in every day and you checked in at the front desk and then you went to whatever floor your martial art was. So karate is level one, taekwondo is level two, and so on and so on, all the way up to every martial art. And every day you walk in to check in, you look to your left and you notice a guy's trying to set the building on fire. And you just ignore it 
Because if you just worry about your people and you just worry about teaching your own students then everything will be okay. So you ignore that guy. And then eventually he sets the building on fire. That will affect you because it's in your wheelhouse. You ignored this behavior and you chose to let it happen when you could have done something about it and did absolutely nothing. You are not only just as bad, you might even be worse because you're a selfish human being who's deciding that you will do absolutely nothing about that because it doesn't affect you now. It affects other people, but fuck those people, right? Who cares about what they have? Who cares about what's going on with them? Who cares that this David Arnbeck molested a 15-year-old girl in his home and still runs three martial arts studios today? Who cares about that? Because, hey, it doesn't affect you, right? At the end of the day, evil is not really the opposite of good. The opposite of good is indifference. People who see people do evil things and choose to do nothing about it when they could. And it's just baffling to me how many people really think that by turning a blind eye to this kind of thing and just worrying about you is going to actually help the community because eventually what's going to happen is what's happening now. The amount of uh, pedophiles in the industry is rampant. And so what happens is if you don't share those stories and you don't talk about it, well, I guess I'll just make my students better. Like, well, why aren't you trying to do anything to stop it? Because guess what? Those are making the martial arts industry look bad. The people who are hurting their students are making you look bad. The people who are raping kids make you look bad. The people who are extorting people make you look bad. It's, it's one of those things where this is our community. What are we going to do to make sure that it stays good or stays positive? If you just keep ignoring the bad shit, you're basically just inviting it to happen. Uh, we can do something about that by standing up, talking about it. So that's, I guess, why I think that things are going the way that they're going and why there's so many cases. Is because so many people who consider themselves good are doing absolutely nothing when they see horrific acts. Mm. So as a movement towards a solution, it sounds like you're emphasizing a lot the conversation, having the conversation, exposing people to that information, like even myself. Uh, now, as you're telling me how bad it is, it makes me think like, oh, actually, it's worse than I thought. And then it makes me consider much more about it. Uh, so, so that's one part. Is there anything else you think like that people could do directly or like any other part of a solution that could be an option? Well, I mean, I, I think that spreading information is really important. Like if you look at something called the Truth Campaign, the Truth Campaign was an anti-smoking campaign that happened in like the 90s and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And basically what they would do is they would just spread information on these commercials. So one of the commercials, for instance, is like all these people standing in Times Square and then all of a sudden they just fall down on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then like one word would come across the screen. It's like X amount of people die from secondhand smoke every year. And then that was the commercial. And then they'd have another one where a guy's like got a tracheotomy, so he's got a voice box. And so he's like on there talking about his cancer of the throat or another one's like somebody's jaw is missing. And then they're talking about their issues that they had with smoking. Mm -hmm. They didn't go up to like, because a lot of people think, which is a, a completely fat shit crazy idea, that if you just go and fight these people, that that will solve the problem. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if I go up and punch the president of Marlboro in the face, it doesn't stop people from smoking now, does it? No, it gets me in jail for assault. Like It's not one of those things that you can just fix by beating people up. People in cults right. don't leave cults. And even if you hit them with like a moment of truth, then they have cognitive dissonance. They believe this thing their entire life. And all of a sudden you show them the truth. They still have to make a decision on their own. Do I continue to go down the path that I'm going, which is easier? These are my friends. These are my family. This is my hobby. This is my mentor. This is what I do. This is my life. And do I give all of that up and change my mind? Or do I just keep going with it? Most people just keep going with it. It has to be a decision they make on their own to get out of the cult. And so my theory, and I could be wrong, but I'll spend an entire lifetime at least doing this to try to figure out if I'm right, is that I might not be able to pull people out of the cult. But If I spread a lot of information, maybe I can stop the cult on the back end by giving so many people so much information about these cults that they stop going to them in the first place. So I might not be able to save the people who are already in there. We might not be able to as a community, but what we can do is spread more information to be able to help people make better, more informed decisions about who they're entrusting their hobbies and their life and their safety with. Um, and maybe they'll make better decisions. And we can do that by spreading information. Yeah. Yeah, that rings a bell. I mean, that, that sounds true. And when I'm, again, thinking about my personal journey, uh, I wasn't in an Aikido cult, which was extremely toxic. You know, there was no, they weren't abusing me financially or in, in any other way, but still 
it was definitely toxic. It was not great. And uh, one of the first plays I started considering that not everything is great about it is I met a BGJ guy who, you know, well, BGJ doesn't necessarily mean you're a good guy, but that guy was, he was a great guy, smart, uh, curious, and he happened to do BGJ and we had a lot of conversations with him. And he never told me like, oh, this is good, this is bad. He respected like you know he respected me for teaching because I was still teaching at the day, but uh, but he would question with curiosity. He's like, ah, oh, but what about this? Like, what about this movement? And eventually, my uh, he offered me to go to jujitsu tournament uh, because he was training me like privately. And my instructor, Aikido instructor, he was against that. He was like, no, this is gonna ruin your Aikido, etc. And and I decided to stand by my sensei side and, and tell my friend like sorry I can't go and that really like he couldn't understand it now looking back I'm like I I understand why he didn't understand at the time it looked natural to me like okay well my sensei said so it makes sense but it's like you know one adult man telling another adult man what he can't do it's, it's crazy especially when there's no formal real relationship anyway that being said my friend was uh, really surprised and, and he started questioning, like, are you sure? Like, does that make sense? And initially I didn't want to go down that path, but then with over time, I started thinking more about it. I started thinking like, okay, all, all these topics we spoke about functional martial arts. I learned that uh, MMA guys are not meatheads because that was a big narrative in Aikido. It's like, oh, these combat sports athletes, they're just meatheads, brutal, etc. But I heard like stories, they're, they're not. And I met this guy and I learned so much. And I realized, hey, something is off. And only then I started to really like start to transform. But if I didn't have that information, probably would, would have taken me so much longer to get disillusioned. So yeah, I guess. You bring I, up a good point too. Um, you know, you were, you were able to start peeling away at the layers of the issues that you were in because someone came to you from a place of care. They didn't, I'm, I'm doubt. It sounds like they weren't making fun of you. It sounds like they weren't yeah. picking at you. It sounds like they were genuinely curious or at least doing that for your sake to try to get you to think on your own. And then you made your own decision to leave what was going on. Mm -hmm. And when you look online, a lot of people who are just like going after the students, like mm -hmm. calling them the major issue, like a lot of people on my page go, well, who's worse, the student or the, uh, the con artist. And it's always the con artist. Like, you know, if there's a sucker born every minute, there's a con artist born every five, you know, because mm. in order for you to join the cult in the first place, there has to be the cult leader. Mm. There has to be the one manipulating you. And uh, I just I find it interesting that so many people think by being overly aggressive towards these victims of cults that they're, they're going to somehow fix it. Like coming having somebody like who came to you is gold. Coming to somebody from a place of care, asking questions, not condescending to them, but really caring about them will make you think on your own because you now have somebody who's in your corner, not against you, um, you know, because what happens when, you know, somebody starts pulling you, you know, you start pulling back. What happens when somebody pushes you? You push back. What happens when somebody's on your side? Well, your walls come down a little bit and you're able to talk to them from a place of care and then you can really start having a good dialogue. I agree. I agree. So when you mentioned Heydrich and his childhood, and you mentioned that uh, term victim, I think that's also what a lot of times gets uh, lost in the conversation about fake martial arts, that uh, not to justify whatever, whatsoever what he did, but I think it's so easy to just look at the end product and to hate it. And this is an ex extreme case. It, it did really bad things and, and hurt people like really badly. But even in milder cases, uh, you can also look at those fake martial arts masters and consider, well, actually, potentially, a lot of them are victims of the bullshit themselves. Like they don't even understand that they don't that they don't understand, or their students are victims as well. It's easy to blame the students. It's like, ah, these Aikido people, they're just stupid. It's like, well, they're not necessarily stupid, but you, they were they went through conditions which conditioned them, and if we don't I think in, in the past, that was much more, uh, what's the right word, uh, just kind of conflicting with people much more, like much more against okay. people. And, uh, and I was just like, because I was getting disillusioned and I was very upset about my experience. And so I was like, I get upset, you guys suck. I hated the people who commented the negative stuff about me and we went back and forth. 
But eventually I realized that doesn't get you far. But if I uh, feel for those people or I relate to these people and I realize, well, okay, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't, they haven't experienced, they haven't seen, heard what I heard, experienced, etc. And when I consider that they just lack information and they're not coming, most of them are not coming from a, a negative place. Like, honestly, they're just defensive and their anger is, is more of a defensive mechanism than anything else. When I meet them at that place, there's so much more of a conversation that can happen and, and transformation can, can happen versus, oh, you're stupid. You don't understand anything. Let me explain it to you. I guess. Yeah. You know, I, you know, Robin Black is somebody that I take, you know, I, I really respect Robin Black. I don't know if you've ever met him or ever seen any of his work, but he's a fight analyst. Hmm. And uh, he he's had a life, man. He, you know, he was an MMA fighter at one time. He was a, in charge of a rock band. He was like the lead singer or something like that in a rock band. Hmm. He's lived a full life. And I, sometimes he says things and it's not advice that I ask for, but it's definitely advice I take. And hmm. I noticed that a lot of people will, you know, just like anybody else, you, me, Sensei Seth, I see Mike, any of those guys, like, you know, I know I missed a lot and I apologize, Ramsey do it, but any of us who like, you know, operate in this online presence of martial arts influencers, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, we get people who just don't like us and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think in order to keep your sanity in this particular job, like you have to come from a place of empathy for them. You know, if they're coming at you with hate, this is their therapy. This is how they make themselves feel better about their life. And so I always have this like thing now, which helps me in the long run to stay sane, um, is to basically say, hey, if you want to talk about this, I go live. These particular days, you can join me live and talk to me. And I think I may have had maybe two people in years ever actually take me up on that. And what that was was very telling to me is that these people are hiding behind the screens in order to make themselves feel better. And if that's what they need, they're more than welcome to. But why would I need to argue with them at any point because they feel how, how they feel, you know, get it out of your system, feel better about yourself. But the hard part is they say, don't read the comment sections. And I always do. Cause I want to interrupt. I want to interact with my followers. And uh, I can see why people say, don't do it <laughs> because them comment sections be crazy. <laughs> um, but anyway, I digress. So who was your number two? If James Hydra oh, was right. your number one. True. Number I still have my number two. Uh, which is great because actually this is going to be more uplifting, or I hope, because this is not a case of dark stuff. Uh, it's more for me. I put it at number two because for some reason I just it's 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 funny, and it's for some reason it's appealing to me. I, I just like feel for the guy. So, but you mentioned him. It's Ashida Kim, and and I just I I made number one very dark, and number two. Just funny. Again, for some reason, I, 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 I like Ashita Kim. You mentioned already some stuff about him. My favorite one is uh, that, and correct me if I'm wrong, he, that he wrote a, an erotic novel where he's the main protagonist. <laughs> I just love it. It's just, how can you come up with that stuff? <laughs> so for anybody uh, like, oh uh, my God, it's such a good story. So the right. thing about Ashita Kim is he does consider himself to be an author. And if you ever read anything on his website, right, it's all yeah. written very dramatically, right? right? Because I think that that's the caricature that he wants to actually be. I think Ashita Kim's case is he probably has a very boring life and he probably didn't put in a lot of training and work and effort into what he does, but he's creative. And so what he would do is he would write like all of these things about himself that makes himself seem like such a great dude and incredible. And one of the books that he did write, actually, I think he wrote a couple, by the way, but I think the book is called Dragon Lady, if I remember correctly. And like it's it's supposed to be an autobiography that is basically just porn. And, <laughs> just like, and like he's right, like one of the passages in there is so funny about like his member being so big that he was going to tear this woman apart. And it's like, <laughs> dude, you really like yourself a lot, homie. <laughs> but it's supposed to be an autobiography. It's supposed to be like real, but it just comes off as like a comedy because of how ridiculous it is. Um, but Ashita Kim is like a little piece of gold in terms of like <laughs> martial arts because. I think I can agree with you there, man, because I personally have never seen an Ashita Kim student. Um, uh -huh. I've never heard of him actually. I've seen him do seminars, but I've never really seen him do like have a school. Uh -huh. um, 
I, I've never really seen him like really interact with a lot of people. So I think he might be a little bit more of a recluse. I could be wrong. Um, mm-hmm. but, but he boasts himself up to be this like killer. And he's just like a, he's like a five foot four, like 120 pound dude. He's like real old and right. frail. But even when he was younger, he was still this little tiny right. dude. Yeah. Um, he kind of reminds me a little bit of like Walter Matthau. Um, where he kind of perpetually looked like he was like in his 60s, even when he was in his 20s. And I'm not really trying to make fun of the guy's looks, but I'm saying I'm trying to use that as an example of him kind of being this frail guy that I think is kind of, and on paper, made himself to be something that he's not to make himself feel better. And at that point, I just feel really bad for the guy, you know, because the delusion makes him happy. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, except for the fact that he does teach people. Um, I, and I, I mentioned he does do seminars and things like that. And he's tried to fool people into him being this thing that he's not. And he teaches people. If he didn't teach anyone at all, I would. he would never make a list for me. But he right. does. So, And I do think that he deserves to be talked about on this list. And I, I think that it's interesting that he's your number two, because I do <laughs> like the, the way that you spun it, which is like, right. it's a little more funny and lighthearted to look at his right. stuff. But at right, the same right. time, I feel so bad for him, because I think the delusion is what's making him happy in life, you know? And most of the time, there's nothing wrong with that, except for the fact that he's teaching people utter garbage and trying to convince people that they can do things physically they cannot, which will give them a false sense of security. Definitely. Yeah, that, that dark side of him, and I also think it's not as major as, as some of the other ones, but the, even the fact that he wrote so many books, and when I made a short bit about Ashita Kim on my channel, some people commented that they actually bought those books, they read them, and especially in the older times, but they believed those books and they were influenced by those books. So, so he probably, I imagine, made, maybe he didn't make him rich, but he probably got a bunch of money for pure nonsense. So still, that's kind of, all, but, and, and that's kind of a philosophical debate too. So who's guilty here? Is it him for writing the book and selling it, or is it the person who is buying the book and actually believes him? I don't know. It's a big philosophical question, but it's a big one in this subject. What, what do you think? I don't think that we should victim blame in a case like this, because it's not like these people are going out of their way specifically to find a fraud. Mm-hmm. These frauds are coming into their life. And when it comes down to like people joining up with this stuff, again, it's somebody who's uneducated in the martial arts who comes across the stuff, who looks at that, and that's their first intro to martial arts. And a lot of times people who sign up at martial arts gym sign up at the first one they went to. Um, And even sadder than that is the average person's knowledge of martial arts is so little that the only question they know to ask when they join a martial arts facility is how much does it cost? That's like the most important question to them. And if it meets yeah. what they, they're looking for, then okay, we'll just pay that because it's cheap enough. Mm-hmm. Um, even weirder is in the martial arts community, martial artists seem to think that a good standard is to be cheaper. Um, and anyone who's charging more than them has to be a fraud or a McDojo. Yeah. It's right. like, yeah. that's yeah. not the case because yeah. that just means you have no clue how business works. <laughs> so you're thinking like, if you're going to not want to charge people and take the moral high ground, Okay, I can see you trying to do that. But if you're going to charge people and then not be able to pay your employees, by the way, happens all the time where people say, I'll, I'll trade you classes for you teaching here. Yeah, um, yeah. You're not going to give your employees insurance. You're not going to help pay their bills, even though they're working for you. And then if they decided that they can't work for you anymore because they need an actual job that you're not providing them, somehow you should excommunicate them because they're <laughs> traitors. Um right. You're the McDojo homie, not the one who's charging enough to be able to pay pay their employees, pay their mortgage, be able to advertise, influence more people, have equipment that's up to date, make sure they have cleaning supplies. All of that stuff costs money. And so if you think you're taking the moral high ground by not being able to provide your students with a better experience, you might want to internalize a little bit more, (laughs) right? So, uh, you know, and with Ashita Kim, back to him, you know, like, it's it's just a weird example because all of these people are so unique in their delusion. Right. But yeah. for him, I really do feel bad because I really do think the delusion is just to make him have some type of confidence that he maybe didn't have before. You know, boost right. himself up, make him think that he has this great life and he did all these adventures and on paper that sounds so good. So let's write books mm-hmm. and spread the adventures of Ashita Kim to the world. Yeah, you probably should have just left that a character and not actually <laughs> tried to be that character, you know? Right. I guess he's almost like faking it until he makes it, but it's just he's doing that forever. And, and oh, I, God, that's sadder. <laughs> so right, much sadder. Yeah, right. And I also think 
maybe it, it, it's almost kind of funny too. I've been in a few moments in my life where I thought, I wish I didn't have as much critical thinking as I do, especially these days, because sometimes it makes me kind of miserable. You know, I'm like, oh, actually, when I think about it, this sucks and this sucks. And, you know, this is bad. Like, like my fiance, she's very positive. She's smart, has good critical thinking. So I'm happy about that. But she's also very positive and she believes in people much more than I do now. I used to believe in people much more now, but now I'm much more cynical and skeptical. When we meet someone, I try to be objective. But still, if I start to notice some patterns of some type of behavior or or way they they do things, take make decisions, I sometimes see from like, eh, yeah, this person's probably actually a douchebag, and this person is probably this, and I'm like, damn, it makes me kind of miserable sometimes because I I don't you know have this positive experience uh, kind of expectation of oh life is amazing and you know life is amazing, the world is amazing, but I also see so much shit that sometimes it's more difficult to be positive. And then I cannot be in, live in for the, into the shoes of Sheila Kim. But then what you mentioned, there is a possibility that he's actually happy because he's so delusional and he lives in his world of illusion. And he's like, yeah, he's, I'm, I'm the best. And, and then, yeah, maybe he's happier than, who knows, than I am. So it's, you know, it's crazy. Maybe. Uh, yeah. There's a book that you should read if you're like... Yeah if that's an actual crisis for you, like, which mm-hmm. I think it's a crisis for me too. I think the older I get, the more cynical I get, especially right. doing the job I do. Oh my God. Right. Yeah, um, right. exactly. Harder and harder to see the positive when all you deal is with the negative. But right. um, there's a book called flowers for Algernon. And mm-hmm. if you've never read it, it is a fantastic book, but it's written as a, almost like a memoir. So, mm-hmm. but it's written in the perspective of the person who the character is right Mm -hmm. and so in the book it's about someone with a mental handicap who's slow Mm -hmm. and he's writing like a diary because his therapist is telling him to do so so he starts writing the diary so in the first like like every entry at first is like really short and it's all misspelled because it's from his perspective it's just as smart as he is in that moment and he's about to go through a surgery and that surgery is going to boost his intelligence Hmm. And so he's writing about his experience as a journal. And then as he goes through the the surgery, you can see that every time he goes into the, the, do a journal entry after his surgery, it becomes a little bit longer and more thought out. And his words become a little, you know, more syllables start to get Hmm. added. And, you know, all of a sudden he reaches an X, 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 the same crisis that you're talking about right now, which is when he was not intelligent, Uh he thought that all these people were his friends. What he didn't realize was he wasn't smart enough to see that they were just making fun of him. And so he was laughing what he thought with them. They were just laughing at him and treating him less than that. Once he starts to get some intelligence under himself, he starts to realize, oh, my God, these people are just making fun of me. Mm -hmm. And then once he gets really intelligent, like ultra off the charts intelligent, Uh he becomes miserable because he is the only person that can relate to the things he's thinking about. So he went from ignorant bliss to understanding people don't like him to now being so intelligent that he can't relate to anyone. Mm. And then at the end of the book, he has an option. They let him know that either this can be a permanent thing for you or you can, because he discovers that this is going to be a temporary thing. He becomes smarter than the scientists and realizes that his IQ is going to drop back to where it was, but he's smart enough to realize that, Hey, I can actually show people how to do the surgery to fix me and make it permanent. Or I can go back to being ignorant. And that's, that's, I won't tell you the end of the book, but I suggest you read it if you're looking for understanding that crisis. I don't think a book has ever done it better. That sounds like a really cool book. Like such such a great book. My favorite book ever written. My favorite. What's the name again? Flowers for Algernon. Okay. I'll I'll look it up. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Okay. Um, Well, uh, I feel we covered Ashita Kim. To, well enough <laughs> again <laughs> these guys could have their own like uh documentaries what but i'm almost afraid to ask so so what's your number one because your number two was pretty hard for already um my number one is one that most people probably will not be aware of but it is probably the reason i picked him as number one is because he's still operating today okay. and some of the things I'm about to tell you he admits to doing but his students still follow him anyway to a fault it is crazy how culty it's probably the biggest cult i think i've ever actually been involved with or not been involved with but i've covered 
because I got to feel how culty they were firsthand. So it's a guy named Edon Abelnick. And Edon Abelnick runs a thing called the Kala system. Now, Edon Abelnick's martial arts training is Krav Maga. And so he decided that Krav Maga wasn't good enough. He was going to start his own system called the Kala system, which is just Krav Maga. <laughs> like, but he just calls it something different. So what brought my attention originally to Edon Abelnick was the type of training methods that he would employ. So the type of training methods, one of the videos that I covered, by the way, which again, this is kind of like a personal opinion. I'm not like saying that this is or is not. I'm just curious what other people's thoughts are because my personal opinion is this is abuse. So he has like, you know, he, he like yells at his students, calls them like pieces of shit and calls them garbage and they need to man up and be tougher and stuff like that. So there's like a video of like a woman getting just like literally smacked in the face open handed while they're trying to do this training. And then they're trying to do like a knife disarm. And this one of his instructors is doing this and smacking this woman in the face, grabbing her, snatching her around. Then he pulls out this rubber training knife. And when he goes to stab her, all of a sudden the resistance goes away and he just falls over and he, she's able to get the knife away from the guy. Uh, That's not realistic training. That's right. abuse disguised as realistic training. Then he has like this instructor course where he's like palm healing this woman in the face so much. She starts nose bleeding. He's screaming in her face to be better and stuff like that. It's utter ridiculous. To me, it's abuse. Right. Um, and I come from a place of not ignorance when it comes to this because I am sponsored by a Navy SEAL run company and they, we talk and I visit them quite often and I've been able to work with them. And when I do, I show them these things because I need their opinions because these are the tip of the spear guys and they believe that this is abuse. And mm -hmm. so when people say, like, they always jump on that bandwagon of, like, special forces units do this. No, they don't. They absolutely don't. And, again, going back to these guys who run Kill Cliff, uh, who, who was the company that's run by SEALs, one of the things that always echoed out to me that they keep repeating to me when I show them these things is, why would a government spend millions of dollars on your training just to put you in a place where you will be injured or hurt, mm -hmm. like, a real, without any real benefit? And so like, yeah, is some of that training dangerous? Sure, it's, it's risky and stuff like that. And do people do get injured or killed during training missions and stuff like that? Absolutely. But they're going to do the best that they can to try to make it as safe as possible. And if there's no benefit to what's going on, they will not be doing it. Like for instance, like what I'm about to cover right now, Edon Abelnick shot a student doing gun disarms with live ammunition, shot a student, it admits to shooting a student. And by the way, everything I'm about to tell you, he admits to. He himself in writing has admitted to. So he threatened to sue me over this, but he can't. He knows he can't. So Edon, kiss my ass two times because you can't sue me over some stuff that I have that's factual. This is just information going to the public. He admits right. to shooting the student. Shot a student doing gun disarms with live ammunition. And then his students jump to his defense. Well, I've never seen him do this before. So then I post videos after he has shot students of still doing gun disarms with live ammunition, still yes. doing it. Then he's doing this in South Africa, by the way, when he does this, the actual gun range owner found out about this and was like, he found out about it because one of the videos went viral and he could see like, oh my God, that's my gun range, which they should have been monitoring better anyway. And then he writes a letter to the police and files a report and saying, yo, he's operating illegally with a firearm on our range. Um, then kicks the guy off the gun range. That particular interview that I did with that guy, which I haven't put that out yet because I'm still editing and gathering more information. But in that particular interview, the guy said, and this goes to the cult-like behavior, that one of Edon's students walked into that gun range with a loaded AR-15 and started talking to him. Now, if you know anything about gun ranges, you cannot walk into a lobby with a loaded gun. Right. Um, and so he was talking to him about the issue and the guy felt threatened and told the guy that he had to leave. Now, that's a culty thing to do. And so trying to defend him. So eventually he kicks him off the gun range. Again, I have nothing but proof to, to this fact. Yeah. Now, the next thing, again, people go, well, that's how special forces units do it. No, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. I guarantee you, if you go to any military base whatsoever and you go onto the gun range and you point a loaded firearm at somebody, they will kick you out. And chances are good you're going to have to deal with some legal repercussions as well. It's not something that they allow. And so then we move forward. And then Edon Abelnick, of course, doing this kind of stuff, this abusive behavior, he gets called out by people for lying on his resume. 
Edon Abelnick himself said, well, hey, just because it's on my website, I didn't write the website. One of my developers wrote the website. It's their fault that there's a mistake on there. I can tell you right now that nobody in the history of websites ever put something on there that you didn't ask them to write. Sure. And, and so, but he denies that and that's up to him, but he gets called out online. So he starts setting up challenge matches around the world. Like people would challenge him, be like, Hey, I'm going to be in the area. Right. Mm -hmm. I interviewed one of the guys who challenged him and said, well, if, like, cause Edon Abelnick would challenge people to matches, not the other way around. So they would say, Hey, you're full of it. And he'd say, well, you're more than welcome to fight me. And those people would agree. They'd be like, okay. And so he would set up times and places where he would be there and just doesn't show up. Oh, wow. And so if you're not going to do that, just say you won't, but don't set up a time and a place and a location yeah. and then just not show up. That sucks for the person. <laughs> exactly. They're like waiting for you. You just don't show up. It's like, all right, well, I'm not about challenge matches, but if I'm going to agree to something, then I'm going to be there. Um, and so, but he tries to boast himself as like this big, bad dude, but he won't even show up to the own, his own matches that he sets up. <laughs> so like it goes to show that there's a track record of him just being full of it. Then on top of that, it gets worse. Um, he set up multiple seminars around the world. I have at least three cases that this happened where he set up these different seminars that he was going to be going to. And he makes all the people who were going to attend pay in full up front. Mm. He gets all that money. Then he himself does not show up. People asked and said, hey, you didn't show up. I wanted to do the seminar with you. You didn't show up. I want a refund. He refuses to give them refunds. He says, well, you can just do another one later on. No, if somebody needs a refund for a service that you said you would provide and you didn't provide and you refuse to give them the money back, that is fraud. That is the legit definition of fraud. And so he's done this multiple times. And again, he himself has admitted this. None of the things that I have told you are not backed by proof and evidence. And the video I'll send you with the link, it, I'll, he's got, I have screenshots of him admitting to all of these things that happen. Now, knowing that his resume is fraudulent to some extent, knowing that he shot a student, knowing that he set up matches with people and never showed up, knowing that he frauded people by not paying them their money back that they requested for a service he didn't provide, knowing all of this, he's got an international organization. He's got studios all over the place of the Kala system. And students just seem to not care that he's done these things because his stuff is quote unquote legit. And so people are willing to ignore all of these facts and still stand behind him just because his technique must be good. That is a real cult. When you could ignore all of these egregious acts from fraud to shooting somebody to negligence with a firearm to continue to be negligent with a firearm, even after getting caught and hurting somebody to setting up all these matches and not showing up to lying on your resume, all of these things, all in which he admits, like even, even the resume thing, he was like, well, it, you know, it's not right, but I didn't sign. He always has an excuse, right? right? After I put out the story about him, his followers in droves came and just started, you're, you know, you're lying about this man. This is wrong. He's a good man. These are good techniques. If you go and look at any of the arguments that I've had with people online about this, I always ask them the same thing and none of them can tell me an answer. Still today, I said, what did I get wrong? Mm. None of them can answer, even Edon himself. And mm. so this dude like threatened to sue me. He was mad that I did the story about him. I'm like, why are you mad? All of these things you yourself admitted to, you're mad mm. that I just told people what you already admitted to? I don't understand why you're upset about that. Um, I think what he's mad about is the fact that he got caught. Then he went on to a video and said, we're going to pursue a lawsuit. Okay, I'm still waiting. Then he sent me a message, a direct message and said, I'm going to sue you. That was a long time ago, homie. I'm still waiting on the lawsuit. And as a matter of fact, I'll tell you what, send me a subpoena, send me a lawsuit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that piece of paper. I'll show the world that you did that. And I will wipe my ass with that subpoena. And I'll show up in court with my lawyer and I will counter sue the dog shit out of you. And as a matter of fact, when it comes down to it, the reason he cannot sue me is because I have evidence of him himself admitting to absolutely every one of the things I just said, including eyewitness testimonies, by the way, from the people he set up challenge matches to and didn't show up to, and including the actual gun range owner himself. So with that said, anybody out there who absolutely loves Edon, Look into what I wrote about him. Look into what is out there. Look into the information he himself has put out there because that is a cult that is going on right now. Hmm.
Yeah, well, what I'm about to add is not 100% parallel, but again, <laughs> makes me look back at my experience being part of, of uh, somewhat of a cult. Uh, and uh, the interesting part about the Sensi there was that it was never his fault. Like, uh, it took me a while to, to understand that, but every single time he would talk about, like I mentioned, his wife left him. But I remember the narrative was he was telling me like, oh, yeah, just one day uh, I come back home and none of the stuff is there. And she just left a note and she left me and she put essentially she portrayed her as the bad person. But I, now I'm looking back, I'm like, a, a woman wouldn't leave like that for no reason. I'm pretty sure she had a good reason, but he didn't stop and say, yeah, you know, I wasn't such a good husband or maybe I did something wrong. Never. And this is, you know, I'm talking about relationships, but the same happened with, with students. It's like, there are so many fallouts that he had with his major senior students. You know, I could just like count them on fingers and I wouldn't have enough fingers. And it was always their fault. It was like, oh yeah, that person was not spiritually mature enough. And that person, he, he didn't understand and he was sensitive enough to understand what we're doing. It was never his fault. And I think for a student, I, for some time, I was on his side. I was like, oh man, these, these guys, they're really evil. Like, like none of them understand him. I understand him, but they're clearly not good enough. And then it's easy to become defensive for that person and be like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All of those guys are bad because that's the narrative you get delivered. But I think that was still not at the same major level that you just mentioned uh, with this guy. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, to me, he, he definitely is the top of my list that I think mostly because a lot of the people that we did discuss today are no longer operational. Mm. You know, like we talked to Sheeta Kim, I do believe doesn't really own a school. You know, he does seminars here and there. You know, James Heydrich is in jail. Uh, George Dillman's retired. Jeff Prather is still teaching, you know, and his is pretty bad. But, you know, Edon Abelnick, on the other hand, is one of those people who's still operating today and he has done Almost everything I can think of that you could do possibly wrong as somebody who's an instructor and then his students will still back him no matter what he has done. And it's it's even crazier because out of all these people like, you know, James Heydrich himself admitted that what he did was fraud and he's one of the only people. But James Heydrich said that and then he got put in a mental institution like Edon Abelnick, on the other hand, said it and then people still praise his name. Like, I don't care what kind of training you are. Let's say Edon Abelnick, for instance, is the best martial arts instructor on the planet, right? Well, he's still a fraud <laughs> because he ripped people off by not providing the service he said he would provide and does not give money back. He's still dangerous because he shot a student due to personal negligence by doing gun disarms with a firearm. After he did that, he still decided that he was going to do gun disarms with loaded firearms um, you know, he lied on his resume and he pushes that blame. All of these things, he pushes the blame off to someone else. And people still think he can do no wrong. And even weirder is that there are some people out there who think, yeah, but his technique is okay. Check your moral compass. If you think that people could do crazy crap like this, and that still be okay with you to pay that man money to continue to take advantage of people and rip them off and put them in harm's way. You're giving this man money to do so. Like, you can do whatever you want. I would never tell somebody what to do and what not to do with their own money and their own personal time. But you really need to pay attention to what you're really believing out of this guy's mouth. Because just because he's smacking you around doesn't mean it's realistic training. Just because he's pulling a firearm out on you and it's got loaded bull, like a, the gun is loaded, doesn't make it like, oh, this is realistic training. It's good for me. How many times have we seen people spar over concrete without headgear, get knocked out, hit their head on concrete and die? Well, that's realistic, right? That's what's going to happen yeah. in real life. Is yeah. that really how you want to train? There's a line. And at the end of the day, he has not only crossed it, he leaped over that thing, got in a taxi and went as far over that line as he possibly could. Hmm. Hypothetical question. Uh, what do you think is going to happen to him? Eventually, because right now, as you said, his students are really hardcore defending him. He's essentially still successful as far as his business goes, although so much crap is public about him. Do you think that's going to last long or do you think this is going to fall apart? What do you think? Absolutely will last long. I think that he's got his people so brainwashed in here. I'll even toss this out there for you. Anybody who's watching this right now, check out the comment sections whenever this video gets released. 
And I promise you somewhere in there, you're going to get people defending him. And I promise you this, since this is the only, isn't the only time I've talked about these things. And by the way, when I give you the video for you to like chop up and add all the, the scenes yes. or whatever you want to add in pictures, yes. all of it includes evidence of everything I just said. So yes. whenever I do toss this kind of stuff out there, even though all of that is 100% true and admitted by him, there mm -hmm. will be people in your comment sections who will be utterly upset at me and you for having this conversation about him. I'm curious whether that's going to happen. Like, uh, it, it's almost hard to believe. Like, I believe 100% that you have these cult-minded students of him defending him directly in a video which opposes him. I'm curious if it's going to go that deep over down the rabbit hole that a video where he's like the main number one, but still a while into a video, if that's still going to bring up those students, that's going to be like even more impressive. So Absolutely. I'm, because, I'm curious well, because okay. one, I'm, I, I, he is the top fraud to me right now. And so since he's number one, I'm sure that people will be like watching the video to find out who the top one is and it'll right. get back to him. And when it does, I'll get harassed and you'll get harassed. I already okay. understand it. But two things. One, you harassing me is not going to stop me from spreading the truth. Two, kiss my ass. <laughs> I like the two very much. <laughs> well, good, the two especially. Um, so as a, as a summary of thoughts, like we went through a lot. And, and obviously, again, this is your profession. This is what you do. So I'm sure you thought a lot about this, but still having like spoken about all of this uh, and discussing about it, what are the main thoughts which are like in your mind right now after the whole, uh, the whole conversation? Well, one, thank you for having me on to do this conversation. I've been wanting sure. to collaborate with you for a while. I absolutely love your stuff. And I'm glad that you go out there and you put your stuff to the test. And you're really trying to walk that line to show people what your journey is. And you're, you know, obviously martial arts journey is the thing that you're really doing. And so because of that, I think that that's really going to help a lot of people understand like what it's like to go to different arts and to come from your background and move forward. So I think what you're doing is amazing. Um, so I appreciate you wanted to collaborate and you accepting the collaboration because I do believe I came to you with wanting to do something. And then you came back and you were like, dude, it's, I have the yeah. idea. And I was like, let's yeah. do it. It's um, crazy. I just to quickly jump in there. It's crazy how long we lasted without making a co collaboration because, you know, we're like the again, like you're doing the the like dojo things on the on a professional level and this is like just like a, one of the subjects but still like there are a lot of parallels between the content of my channel so it's, it's kind of crazy that it took so long for us to <laughs> finally yeah get well funny enough done. i didn't even start doing like real collaboration collaborations until this year like i see uh -huh. mike to be honest is kind of the one that kind of put me on to it because right. you know he was doing like a thing where you know he asked people to go to a school and you do collaborate with all these different people right. And, uh, you know, I think that he really kind of spearheaded that thought mentality to me. And, you know, maybe I should do more collaborations. It should be more active. Um, yeah, and plus, good. it gets me out of this damn chair. <laughs> it gets me to, like, places to actually train. Um, but the other thought is, is I think that when you're going to sign up at a martial arts school, whether you're trained or not, I think that everybody at a martial arts facility who is an employee should be locally and federally background checked. I think those background checks are extremely important in order to make sure that people with a track record of doing wrongdoings is caught before they get put in a position of power, especially when it comes to pedophilia and things like that. Um, I think the other thing is everybody in a martial arts facility who is an employee should be CPR and first aid certified. You're in a very physical environment. Things happen all the time. People catch injuries here and there. Even if you're the safest you can be, it's still a very physical, demanding sport that you're doing. Um, so your instructor should be CPR and first aid certified. Um, I also think that there should be a defibrillator on site at absolutely every martial arts facility because I've seen way too many videos of people having heart attacks during martial arts training and there was nothing that anybody could do about that because they just simply didn't have the equipment. Um, and so I think that if you incorporate those three things, hmm. making sure that your people are background checked, not just locally, but federally in the United States anyway, the equivalent all over the world. I think that your people should be first aid CPR certified, and I think there should be a defibrillator on site. I think if you're doing at least those three things, we can eliminate a lot of the issues that we have. Like, for instance, if you were to be one of James Heydrich's students back in the day, you could look that in 1977, this dude had like an egregious, horrific act and that he was in prison three times in a row. That might stop you from wanting to sign up at his gym. I'm just guessing, you know? Um, and so when you look at 
you know, uh, what was the other guy? Jeff Prather. You can see that he was fired from the DEA. If you just did that due diligence to look into these people, you would know about these crazy acts that have happened. And if you look at my page, all I'm really doing is collaborating all this information that is already out there for the public to see. And I'm just putting it in one place so that way people are made aware of what type of people they're about to sign up with. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, that makes a lot of sense and also makes me reflect back again about my times teaching. And now with this, with a sane brain, I'm puzzled and confused. Like how was I given permission and the blessing to teach? And, you know, part of, I guess that's the whole philosophical debate whose fault is it again, but I think it's fair to say I was like 22. So my life experience was very small. I had a lot of respect for my instructor and I thought, okay, he knows what he's doing. He's running his school. So I didn't question that, but he sent now looking back the fact that he gave me permission to teach, uh, like not only permission, but like a blessing, uh, an encouragement to have a full-time school with children. And again, well, then I was 22. So already still, I did not know so much stuff, which I think, like just what you mentioned, like even the, like CPR and, and having a, uh, the proper equipment. So that's crazy. But then my first Aikido instructor, I was a minor. I was like 14 or I was 15 when he gave me uh, his kids classes to teach. And I think that happens fairly often. And I wasn't an, uh, an exception to the rule. Like I and he left me alone to teach a bunch of kids. And I'm like, how does that work? You know, back then, okay, that seems so cool. That was so that was so nice for me to experience. But now I'm like, you cannot leave a kid teach other kids. So many things can go wrong, and luckily it didn't. But I wish uh, more smart people were observing and uh, putting some limitations to all of that. So, so yeah, makes sense. Absolutely. Mm. So I'm very happy we didn't uh, limit ourselves. Thank you very much for. Uh, being so flexible with your time. I really appreciate that. Absolutely, man. This is what I do, man. I really hope that this kind of stuff helps people. That's the whole reason right. I do it. So, you know, us being able to do these collaborations and put this information out there for people to see, hopefully will help people, which is the ultimate goal. Make people's thought processes a little different when they're going to look at martial arts facilities and studios. Right. Um, not just put instructors on pedestals just because they have a, a piece of rope, <laughs> a piece of cloth around their waist. Uh, you know, it's like, they're just people and we all make mistakes and I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. No one's perfect. We all make mistakes. But at the end of the day, where's the line that we draw when we start putting a lot of our trust and a lot of our effort and time into a certain person, like no one's perfect. And if you look at somebody like they are, you really need to second guess, like how you're looking at the situation. Like maybe you are involved in a cult. If that person can do no wrong, you might be in a cult. Hmm. Yeah, it's great you're bringing that up because uh, especially recently I was thinking about, I don't know if you ever, this is off record, off subject, but if you ever read the book, uh, Always Start With Why, it was, became pretty famous for some years no, ago. I never, but it's like, I never read it, but I will. Uh, it, it's a nice book, uh, but the whole idea is that uh, most companies or projects, they focus on the how and what and forget the why, and that's why they suffer because the inspiration disappears and, and the authenticity. But uh, so I was thinking about my content. I was like, oh, you know what? I haven't really uh, put so much focus on the why anymore as much as I used to. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But meanwhile, it was great to hear you. It's clear that you have a very strong and clear why. Like there's a passion uh, driving you behind what you do. And when I was preparing to make this video, I was because I'm thinking about this, I was like, also like, okay, so what's the why of this video? And I had this idea, okay. This is you know, educating people, giving them a chance to spot shady characters earlier or better. But I was just kind of just, oh, that's a nice idea. That's what I thought. But now that I listened to you and the way you defined it all and, 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 and described it, I'm like, oh, yeah, actually, that's a pretty good why. That's like, that's, that's <laughs> legit. It's not just a thing. This, this actually has a good purpose. So I'm, I'm very happy. For sure. I think that's why a lot of businesses have mission statements. You know, it's right. always yeah. reminding them of the why you do what you do. Right, right, right.